So we may have to go into intensification of our enterprises. So that is a challenge. Challenges come with that. Waste has to be disposed of. The more intensified, the more it becomes difficult to manage the waste. So we have to look into it. And we know diarrhea especially has been accused of being one of the, uh, the, the, the enterprises that leads to this final problem here because of emission of methane coming out of the waste that comes of intensified dairy production. So we have to mitigate that. Because we are talking of increasing dairy production, and indeed it is good. It is surpassing uh, commodities like tea in the income we get from exporting it. But as we do it, we need to watch out. We won't stop, but we need to address those issues. There are issues of uh, zoonosis. These are diseases that can be transmitted from animals to man and vice versa. So as we continue producing and we are intensifying, we may eventually have to live very near our animals. And therefore, the opportunities of diseases crossing over are there. So we have to be very vigilant again on how to address those zoonoses. There is a cost in it, we have to be preventive in, a, in, in preventing, uh, preventive in uh, addressing uh, those. There is the issue of increased antimicrobial use as we continue producing the animals, we continue injecting them with all sorts of drugs and, and then we bring about antimicrobial resistance. We are misusing the drugs Eventually, when the drugs have to be administered to the human beings, the, 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 the agents cannot respond anymore. And when there is antimicrobial resistance, you have to go into looking into more drugs and more drugs that work with attendant costs. So there is also a challenge there. We have to be very vigilant on controlling use, restricting access, to these drugs anyhow, sensitizing the public on how to use them properly and to regulate their use. Thank you for your attention. of Animal Resources and Director of Animal Resources. As I told you, the, the, the minister had not yet arrived, but as it happens, apparently the cabinet has been called today, maybe there's some kind of emergency, so the minister is uh, unable to come, but I'm very happy to announce that the permanent secretary, Mr. Fires Walker, is here, and is going to stand in for the minister. But before I call him, let me take this opportunity on behalf of MAIF and UAA to thank our partners who have funded this conference. These are BNZICA International. Can you please stand up so that we can see who we are talking about? Is Craig here? BNZICA International. <laughs> then there is Bro Africa. Bro Africa. Those came from Mike then we have got ABI. I hope they are here. There's ABI. Then we have got LDF, Livestock Development Fund. They are there. Then we have got HEFA International. Who? <laughs> Until recently, I thought they really handle HEFAs. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> they are development, but that is their name. Uh, then, uh, of course, all of you because by being here, you are partners. Have I forgotten a, a, a partner? Anyway, that, that, those are the ones I know. Now, as uh, Madam Juliet was talking, I had a few whispers behind me and everybody was asking, when will, be, when will it be question time? And I'm like, after the minister's speech. 
But having said that, Madam uh, Juliet, it would be nice for us to know who owns those uh, stock, those grounds in Changwanzi and Katonga. Because as we are talking, I was wondering if government is going back into business. Then just one comment about the urbanization. You know, I always talk about the youth. And I'm always with the youth because I want to look youthful. Now, when, when you talk to any youth, to, from today onwards, you find any youth in the rural areas, ask them what their ambition is. There is, I have not, in the whole of my life, I have not met any youth, those who are dated to me and those who are not from north to southwest. Nobody says they would be happy to stay in the rural areas, or they are planning or hoping or dreaming to become farmers. So here we are busy planning for them to look after food security, but they are very busy planning to move out of the rural areas. I now have the opportunity to call upon the PS to assure us about all that. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister of Victoria's Historical. The business community, government officials who are here present, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. Allow me to begin by explaining the absence of the Honorable Minister, Honorable Vicent Ramalanga Chisendija, who had planned and who was supposed to be here today with us. He had to travel to the north to handle certain urgent items, uh, which was sent by the president. So he left yesterday. He thought he would be able to make it, but this morning he called and he informed me that he completely failed to make it to get here. By yesterday, we suspected that he may not be able to make it and we requested the Honorable Minister of State to be here. But at the same time, we are informed Parliament is discussing one of our papers and she has to be there. And on top of that, uh, the World Bank directors are here in the country and they've invited all sectors that benefit from uh, the funding from World Bank to go and attend that meeting with the President at midday. So you can imagine the challenge that we have. Even myself, I've got to leave as soon as possible to go and I join them in that meeting. So that's why the honorable ministers have been unable to make it to this meeting. But they express their interest and they thank you so much for having made it to come here. Ladies and gentlemen, now I can go straight in the message of the minister, but I've not read it, though I've, I tried to read it, but I know the context in which he was saying it. We are in the mission of transforming the subsistence farming into commercial agriculture, mainly for food security, increased household incomes, and increased exports. I know the doctor has built so much on these issues, but let me put them into perspective and put them in the model in which she's been talking about them. Maybe you come to appreciate much, much more. And the minister really wanted to do this, to make this one to you. Because you, the private sector, you are the ones who are going to drive us from poverty. You are going to help us. As government, we are going to do our best to provide the environment in which you are going to thrive. But the success is going to be driven by the private sector. And I really want to thank you for having organized this. When I was invited to be told about this concept, I didn't even blink for a second. I really said we must have it, and we must have it like yesterday. And I thank Bees Kainu, you are very much in the forefront uh, organizing this event. Thank you very much. We need to give them a round of applause. The partners who have come up to help us to organize this, we really thank you and we really appreciate. This is what we need for our country to see that we drive our people out of poverty. Now, as we do this, there are three main challenges we are faced in the sector. 
and we are working so hard to solve this challenge. The first challenge is production and productivity. Many things we are dealing with are addressing production and productivity. And when I talk about these issues, I address the animal sector, which is livestock, I address fisheries, and I address also crops. But in this meeting, I'll spend more time with the livestock, because that's why we are here today. Now, these challenges, at the same time, they are the opportunities. And we should jump very fast to these opportunities such that we make value out of them. For example, improve the breeds. How do we have the breeds that are going to help us? For us as government, we have our arm, which is a nabric, which is a, uh, supposed to deal with the genetics. But with the private sector, we know you are doing very well and you are doing much, much more. There is talk going on around. As government is giving up its land to private investors and the like. We wish to announce and inform the private sector which is here. That government is not seated. We are aware as government. We are unable to deliver everything that we are supposed to deliver. But the private sector has capacity to do this. And we've been approaching some of the investors, private or corporate, to come and help us in breeding. And we'll announce some of those individuals or companies you are hearing. They are already doing a good job. We wish to encourage you to go and visit them and see what they are really doing. As government, we need to support them. We need to work very hard with them to see that we improve some of these things that we need to work on to get our people out of poverty. Now, climate change is one of the issues that is really disturbing us. It has come along with many challenges, including uh, pests, diseases, vectors that we didn't have here before. They are coming. And we've got really to fight them. You are aware of the ticks which are resistant to the parasites. We caused this, but we must get out of it. As government, there's a strategy we've come up with. We are going through the processes, and really, we must stop it. That has to stop. There are issues related to water for production. You know, areas, we've got to sort out that being brought about by climate change. Varieties that mature very fast, resistant to diseases, all those are challenges that affect production and productivity. And you, the private sector, we know you are doing very well. In fact, some of you know these things better than we do. The next challenge is about value addition. Value addition is affecting us seriously, but we know this is an opportunity where you can come in and invest. We've been selling most of our products very long, and this cannot continue. We must process, we must start small. Those ones who can start big, let us start big. We must reduce these post service losses so that we make money out of them. Today, our neighbors still come here to buy our maize raw. <coughs> this has to stop. And some of the products they make, they bring them back and they sell. Why are we losing in those areas? As government in this area, we are paying attention, like Dr. said, into some of these facilities that are going to help us reduce on the post service losses. In the dairy sector, milk, milk collecting facilities have come up. Investors have been encouraged to process dairy. And as you are aware, we are exporting a lot dairy products. That is very good. As against exporting just the raw milk. For me, I wish to encourage, like, we shall go down there, the investors here, to invest much, much more. We know many of you are investing. Thank you very much. But we would like you to involve the smallholder farmers, as I will go deep into that moving forward. In the crops area, grains, we are investing in storage facilities and would like to partner with the private sector who can process. And as you are aware, government is paying attention in agro-processing moving forward. But we would like to work with the private sector. We are going to provide the infrastructure that is very expensive for the private sector to manage such that we facilitate faster movement into that area. Like yesterday, I was mentioning that those ones who are willing or planning to invest in storage facilities, we are focusing at processing 
high quality feeds for the livestock, for the poultry, and fish. Now, these feeds should be able to supply the local market, the region, and internationally. And we can do it. We can do it. And we have not been paying attention into soybean. But right now, we've gone into promoting soybean as a protein into the animal feeds. And we encourage some of you who are capable of investing in this area. Government has come in already. We are putting money into the people who can develop the seed so that we produce a lot of soybean as a key ingredient in the animal feeds. And for those ones who are going to invest in animal feeds production, we are going to support you. We are going to support you to see that this area is worked upon to avoid the raw materials we are selling outside the country. The third challenge will take us around competitiveness at the market. How competitive are our products on the market? I can hear the cries of the private sector that we have not come in very strongly to support you, but believe me, we are not seated, we are not sleeping, we are working day and night to see that we improve this area of certification. With our colleagues in UNBS and the like, we have challenges like Dr. has mentioned, issues related to the laboratories and the like, but those are going to be sorted out. The private sector, which can come in and help us in this area, you are most welcome. We are going to work with you to see that we improve this area. But the certification, traceability, regulation, and all that is the third challenge we are looking at to see that really we sort out that area. And we are proposing a model to you to use. This model which works in agriculture. As you are aware, really there is money in agriculture. There is money in agriculture, but it requires organization. And as government, for us, we are going to come up, guide, facilitate, do our best to see that the private sector really thrives. And this is the way the economy is going to devolve. We are looking at the zoning she's been talking about. But this is not something that uh, is a must. If somebody can go and invest in an area we're not recommending, well and good. We had a story of somebody who is doing very well in an area which is recommended for other items. It's okay. But we believe if we zone, we are able to collect enough raw material for agro-processing. And we would like to organize the farmers in all forms. And we have already started working on this with our colleagues, Ministry of Trade and Cooperatives. Can we have these farmer groups producing a given enterprise? Can it be circles? Can it be any form, even the cooperatives, but organized in an area? If we can be able, oh, a nucleus farmer who has a big farm producing an item, then without growers around them, then somebody would have capacity to come and invest in agro processing. This can be you, the private sector, or that very farmer group, poor organized. But you can imagine you are creating an ecosystem in an area, producing, for example, mangoes or fruits for processing, like the case in Soroti right now. Because the area has a concentration of fruits, now we can comfortably put a factory. One of the farmers the minister has been visiting, visited yesterday, actually he left at 10 in the night, is this farmer for the fruits in the north. Because he's one, she's one of the farmers where we're going to put a facility. She has organized other farmers, as growers, also to grow fruits. This is the model we believe works. And in the processing facilities we are talking of, we're also focusing in this area for the fruits. You've been seeing a lot of emphasis on to the seedlings and whatever for whatever. This is the vision where we are going. And as we do the storage facilities for post service handling, we are putting more into processing the fruits to see that our people get out of poverty. Things to do like sugarcane. You can say again, efforts in the north are happening. But let us go much more with the livestock industry we are looking at. After organizing the farmers, then comfortably you can put a processor 
who you know has a raw material, constant raw material, which has always been our problem. Somebody comes, puts up a facility, you process for a very short period of time, then the raw material disappears. Really, we must stop this, and we need to encourage you who are in there. If you have a nuclear farm, which is doing very, very well, it makes more business sense for you to invest in the communities that are around you to give you the raw material. That can be in form of soft loans, whereby you encourage them, the skills, as we come also to help. Then you can be able to process your products for dairy and beef, whatever it is, such as you don't sell raw. You know, you even export using the ecosystem you have created yourself around you with the assistance that can be coming along. Then we are challenged with the critical farm inputs all over. If you are organized, your people are organized, they are registered, even the banks will have more confidence in extending the credit facilities. You can be able to bring insurance. You are giving us more ideas on to how this insurance can work better. Thank you very much. But these are key ingredients into the productive ecosystem for agricultural production. And we must work in that kind of model. Then there we come in as a government to provide the extension services to coordinate all those players around. But we encourage many players to come in to provide private security extension services. That is key and is going to help us. So that for us, we stay with our role of guiding policy, certifying, and putting systems in place that are going to help us to get our people out of poverty. But we really believe you, the private sector, don't put up a facility and you look at yourself. Look at the people behind. Because by doing that, people around you, you are doing justice to yourself. And this is what we are encouraging our people to do. Look at how dairy has come out of where it was. If people are to work as individuals, they would not succeed. But it's a model because it is working using collectivism. People who are working together. It is easy to organize. We have things to do with pest diseases, which are a challenge, but we would like to employ you as the public sector to help. Community policing as well, it can help. Government is spending a lot of money into controlling pests and diseases. And yet, what we call as a lot of money can't even contribute even 5% of the problem. So how do we sort out this issue together? The issue of fake account sites, pests in the country and whatever. Really? All of us need to put our arms together to fight this vice. We know these people who are doing this. What happened to the community policy we had before? You see somebody committing an offense and you make an alarm. What happened? In town when you are moving, a thief comes, he's stealing people are just watching, and instead of jumping onto that person and you understand, the same thing is killing us. Because in agriculture, you know, you know, you know what it is. When you talk of poor animal feeds, they end up in the animals and eventually with us, the humans. That's why we should pay much, much more attention. Well, the government is trying with the challenges that we have. We know we can achieve much, much more with the private sector. That's why our invitation here, really this message to come across, we really appeal to you, the private sector, please to help us work with the communities, and also to support government initiatives that are meant to minimize some of these challenges. You know, like I said, I didn't want to read the speech, though it was properly organized. Let me not go into that, but allow me to dwell a little bit much, much more on the issues related to the environment. We are looking we are seeing, and very little is being done. We are countries which are a model into some of the conservation initiatives for the environment. Climate change 
is here with us. And it is only us who can make a difference around climate change. And the initiatives that are going to get us out of this challenge rotate around self-help initiatives. And they start with the individuals, with us who are here. Can we ignore use of Cavera, for example? As individuals, for us to say, when I go to do whatever shopping I'm making, my environments where I have my business, I'm not going to allow polythenes to be near me. And I'll teach my communities not to have Cavera. Before talking about planting trees, when we go to develop agriculture with the biggest countries, if we are going to develop more land, the first thing we do is to clear the environment. But we can do agriculture alongside the environment. We can do with the trees and whatever. We've had floods, storms that are clearing villages. If we had windbreakers, we wouldn't be having that. We're not talking about hurricanes. We don't have such big issues. Ours is just simple storms. But because people have cut all these trees, you understand? That's why we're having these issues. But we have an opportunity to go and reverse this trend where all of us are going to benefit. The couple is to be taken out. And we, the private sector, who interact with these people daily, can we play a part by sensitizing our people, letting them know the advantages. Let us incorporate these initiatives into our business models. Where I'm operating, what am I doing regarding the environment? People who are supplying me, the raw materials I use, can I go and give them back by sensitizing them on issues relating to the environment? This is going to help us. If we all work together, not to wait for the Ministry in charge of Environment or whatever, because this is our concern. These issues are going to increase, not even to reduce. And it is us to start today, not even yesterday. Simple, simple deeds. Can we commit, like, for me, I'll plant, like, five trees a month. Can we make that commitment here? Wherever I am, just five trees a month, I'll go with my family or myself alone. The seedlings cost hardly more than 300 shillings. And you do that, you make a difference. Within five years, we are going to be seeing these things really changing. How am I training our people to deal with the landscapes? The biodiversity issues. Can we sensitize our people, you know, to see that we change that trend? Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to again thank our partners. Thank you very much for your job well done, for supporting us. It should have been the government to do this, but uh, with all our challenges, we were able to do it. We really thank you and we are grateful. Thank you so much, uh, the organizers, AAA. Thank you very much for organizing this event. We really wish to see many more of these. Let us give them a round of applause. I'm glad when I hear talks about the youth. Really, the youth are willing to come and work in agriculture. We just need to show them the market. When we talk of agro-processing, it can be an off-taker. Who picks, you know, those items either for export or for processing or whichever. The youth are wise. If there is market, they will go into agriculture. We need to show cause that they are not going to agriculture and they don't make money. But we, for us, we rely on you to go and help us. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you very fruitful deliberations. We expect to learn a lot from you, and we shall try as much as possible to implement your recommendations. Thank you very much for listening to me. Mr. Pierce, I'm sure he would like to maybe answer a question or two before he leaves because uh, fortunately we now have the, 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 the Entebbe Highway 
So it does not need the whole hour to get to a table. So if you have got one or two quick questions, you can put them. To yes, please. I see a hand there. Yes, please. Your name and uh, straight to the point. And please excuse the protocols, just go straight to the point. No gentlemen already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying me that. Okay. I'll start with you. Thank you so much for organizing this. My name is Ben Twin. I'm here representing the Livestock Development Forum, a partner with the UAA in this. But uh, thank you, the PS, for the support and basically the call for the partnership. But uh, mine is a, is a plea. I'm calling. For the last two years, I've been pushing uh, Honorable Victoria to really push for the livestock. Because it's been crop, crop. Now, we are here. I really, really would like to thank her for that. But LDF, um, it's coming to three years now. We came together as farmers, technocrats, researchers, uh, development partners, and all stakeholders to stop blaming each other and work together to see what what plug can each one of us basically play. We're asking, the only leaf that has been remaining, we, as farmers, we don't know how to make noise. We act and then wait. The, the government is like police. Until something happens, then they come into action. Now, we're asking you, for a full uh, support. Now that we have uh, uh, Honorable Victoria and the UAA who can actually uh, uh, point fingers to where the problem is, where the wounds are, we're asking for support and partnership. We, as farmers, as an initiative, we started a show, a livestock show, exclusively livestock, so that our people, our farmers, can know what is in Uganda, what our farmers are doing, what breeds, and we have all the lines of animals. For the last two years, we have only, on the government perspective, we have only been having one partner, which was Nagrik and DP. Not because it's their line, but because probably they wanted to help. So I'm now calling upon a PS. This is strictly and basically directed on to you, to see how we can partner with NARO, Iriri, or Narili, and other, and the ministry at large. We have the show, we have the forum where we discuss our issues, and we have now supporting a publication. This, the Ishazi. This is the only livestock farmers magazine in the country, in Uganda, and in the region, apart from the South African Stock Farm and Farmers Weekly. Now, you can see there's a small error, the error of the typo on the magazine, but because we're not funded enough, we couldn't actually reprint the cover. But the content here is really, really amazing. So if we could have that, rather than inventing, reinventing the wheel, we'd like to partner with the, with the Grow Africa and UAA so that we can actually take the livestock sector to another level. We have the secretariat which has all the seven and eight lines of animals. Mr. Twine. Yes. Thank you. That is why we are here. Yeah. yeah. But I'm emphasizing on that because we are really crying out. The Thank PS, you so much. The PS has taken note. Thank you so much. Yes, good morning. My name is Anik Eitragen. I'm uh, the CEO of Chemifa Uganda Limited, which is an analytical lab and uh, inspection company. We are in Uganda since 1998 and we've helped, uh, among others, uh, the fish sector um, to revive after the EU embargo. Um, you're talking about uh, the poor animal feed, uh, for example. Um, Though, as a lab, I know that uh, this is hardly tested. Is there a possibility of making this mandatory so that um, the animal feeds are finally quality? 
I think um, uh, as Ugandans we need to focus much more on quality of what we produce um, and uh, I, I think we need to also um, make things more um, regulatory so that we, we make sure that we finally produce quality for better local products but also for exports. Thank you. Thank you, Kemi. Sorry, along those lines, bring the microphone to the front. Along those lines, if any of you has received the form labeled SPS, it is actually from MAIF, please give us feedback. That's the only way MAIF can do what you want to do if you give them feedback. Please fill that form and return it. Can we get somebody from there? Then, yeah, thank you. I'm um, Freelance Cooperative Agribusiness Management Specialist. Now, my, my question is about uh, looking beyond as per animals dying in Ankole Corridor or Nakasongola. Where are our engineers? Can we have a line in this respect in order to help in restructuring the water system so that animals within 40 kilometers radius of Lake Victoria animals to die in the in the Ankole corridor. Then there is this looking beyond the honey as per the bees. Don't you think we need also to protect our bees so that we are used for pollination? We are having this fruit factory in in Teso, in Sorot. We can transfer all these bees to pollinate and then there's backward and forward linkage in that respect. Then the promotion of indigenous knowledge, where we have uh, left to be dominated by the, our neighbors. Don't you think we need to promote indigenous knowledge? The other, day, the other time when I was young, we used to treat foot and mouth disease. When in Britain it was a, a problem. So we need to do that. Then finally, counseling, counseling our neighbors. Fish ponds have been poisoned, poisoned by our neighbors. Dairy animals have been given salt by our neighbors. So I, I think there is, in the, within the agriculture ministry, we need to have counseling for our neighbors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now about the bees, we don't have to transfer any bees to Soroti. They have got more bees than they can handle. Yes, please. <laughs> Yes, on behalf of the minister, we are very happy that you are here as the minister. For me, I'm going to make uh, a request, a general request, for all the farmers in this country. I have tried a number of things. Government must have a policy. You cannot tell us to go uh, producing the thieving problem. I don't know whether other people are not experiencing it, but the thieving of farmers' produce, whether they are animals or crops. The government has to do something about it. There used to be a law that you steal somebody's cow, seven years in jail. But they are taking trucks and trucks of people's produce. The bees that which you are talking they steal the honey. <laughs> I've tried fish, uh, growing fish. They called me at 10 in the night to go and look at thieves. I mean, if you are going to farm and do value addition, do something about fishing, you go to police, they will not help you. They will have stolen your stuff, the chickens, the pigs. They put them on trailers and, and they take them out. I grew maize 10 times. Somebody came to a store. I was so embarrassed. I'm so educated. But they came. They took my 10 tons of maize. They took it to Kisanyi here. And they haven't paid me anything. Mr. P.S., can I get some money? <laughs> I am still not paid. There is nothing I can do. Government must do something about thieving in the agriculture sector. And more, and whatever we do. Thank you very much, sir. And I hope I'll get paid for my 10 times. It's now, they've took it from, from the stores. And I haven't been paid one, one shilling. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Trigo. A. I'm Robert Serwanga. I'm Chief Executive of Agrarian Systems Limited. Robert, 
<laughs> and uh, I don't know if the PS is aware that the maize price today is 1,300 per kilo. And uh, three months ago, it was about 200 to 400 shillings per kilo. As poultry farmers, it is too much for us. And uh, I, I didn't know how to get to you, so I came very fast to make sure you, you help us. To our dismay, our friends in Kenya, where we put a lot of their old chicks into Uganda, closed the borders for, for our eggs not to go to Kenya with the view of protecting their farmers. And here in Uganda, we're allowing everything to come in. For them, they're protecting their farmers. Now, I don't know how this can be handled as fast as possible. And with the farmers, we need immediate reaction. Robert, that is being handled by the president himself. He told President Kenyatta, and Kenyatta told the borders to open. That is, that is good. Uh, now, most recently, <clears throat> we are have, maize is going to be in season in Tanzania in the next one and a half months. But in Uganda, the prices are bad. But for grain to come from Tanzania into Uganda, it is a rigorous process. But for maize to leave Uganda to go elsewhere, it is as easy as a tap. Disappears. We need support. Thank you. Disappears, I'm sure you get the point. Mr. Sembebuya, you remember I said goats will come next phase. <laughs> the goats have arrived. <laughs> Thank you so much. My name is Medi Mwiri. I work with Engineering Solutions to Canada Limited. Yes, Mr. Pierce, I have a few questions to, to pose. The first is to do with upgrade financing. And that's across the dairy sector. And then, um, I think in general, the break sector. Government has provided an agricultural credit facility that's been channeled through the central bank. The reality on ground is that commercial banks are not interested in this. It's something that's been offered at a low interest of 12%. Now, one of the challenges that this sector faces is the problem of a great financing that's affordable to farmers. There is a facility. Can you pause a moment? Where is Richard? If he has gone out, can somebody get him? Richard from Stambi. Because we shall want him to comment on this. Sorry, go ahead. There is a facility, but commercial banks are not interested. As a mother ministry, possibly let us know from your side what could be done to interest the commercial banks to ensure that farmers access this facility. There is, of course, the other challenge attached to it that even those few banks that are doing this, the time of closing this is so long that by the time approvals happen, seasons are gone and farmers cannot be productive. They get the money, but again, it has been taken up by events. So the time of closing is also long. How can farmers be helped in this? Thank you. Uh, one last one, just one last one. I am aware that your ministry is planning to set up regional workshops. Is there a possibility of looking at these regional workshops with a view of giving expert training, especially for operators, in running diary equipment and other associated implements that require proper skills for increased productivity. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. P.S., I don't know whether it wouldn't be better for you to take note of these uh, questions and answer another time, because you will answer anyway, so that we take more questions rather than giving you time to respond to these questions. What do you prefer? I suggest I answer these. Okay. The rest can be noted down. Maybe with whoever has asked, I'll answer them uh, by response, by email or any other form, directly to the individual. Or back here before you leave. You are you are coming back? 
No, no, I'm not coming back, but I can send the response. Yes. Stay to the question, please. Yes, I'm Susan Almanzi from Afrisa. My question goes to the minister, to the PS. As people come out from Afrisa, we are trained, we are a bit trained, we are trained, me I'm specifically into poetry, but we do come out, we go out to look for jobs, actually because we don't have capital. You can't just come out of school and you're able to raise capital. Me, I was in a certain field, then I tried to invest myself in agriculture, so I went back to Afrisa. But actually, we have no capital. And NADS, common wealth creation, they are giving money to people who need training, yet the trained ones will already exist. And where are we going to get that capital to invest into ourselves after investing into education? I'm sure the PS has got the point. The next question can come from a woman. Or a man. Okay, there's a second woman. Hey, my name is Mama Pig. That is Mama Pig. Uh, the issue of policy and compensation, I second my fellow farmer, the lady in front there. Uh, when it comes, first of all, I've been looking at the program, and uh, even when we look through all uh, the health sector plans, the peak industry is always left out, number one. And then number two is that we are always as livestock people, we are always we all we are we always look like we are orphans, all as farmers, mm -hmm. because most of the time, many of these things happen to us. An example is African swine fever, and when it happens, um, for some reason, apart from government putting up quarantines, nothing, nothing, nothing is safe. So you are left. We are left as orphans. We die with our animals. And then we are we, we later rise up if we are we are strong enough. I'll give an example. So many years ago I lost 45 million Uganda shillings in three days. And meanwhile I was the big, the best big farmer then. I could be still, but no one helped in any way. So what am I trying to say? Can you either as we are waiting for the vaccines to come as we are doing research because the uh, Dr. Sentinel was telling us how we have laboratories and we're going to research the vaccines and all that. So as we are waiting for the research to happen, can you at least put up policies for compensation? So that we don't die. We really want to work, but you, you, you just leave us there and we really die alone and then we wake up, you know? Thank you, Emma. I'm sure that PS has made the point. One last question, then the PS will answer. Uh, hello, yes. uh, Mr. Pierce. My oh. name is Stella from Hama East Africa. We're a technology company. One of the biggest issues is I saw uh, Madame say that information management systems for dairy farmers. They can't do this because most of the dairy farmers are in the villages where electricity, even with the rural electrification, hasn't reached. They have a generator for the milk collection center. They can't keep the computer working because they don't have electricity. What is going to happen? Is there anything that is going to happen to improve the cattle corridor electricity and the internet connection? Thank you. Mr. Pierce, since you are going to answer, I'll ask this on behalf of everybody. We hear of water for production. Where is it? And how does one get it? So, can you please answer those that is we can say? Thank you. Thank you very much for facilitating uh, that event. For me, my excitement is increasing because I can hear everybody is alert. The kind of questions which are being asked are very intelligent and they are all meant uh, to improve uh, the performance for the sector. Allow me to start with the point I left out since we are in dairy and beef. I would wish to employ you to go and visit our farm being run by Nano in Nachesesa. Nachesesa? You go and visit. Yeah, there is a lot to learn there. Because we are planning 
to take some of you as farmers to go and visit some of these modern farms in Italy. Uh, but that was going to be a very expensive venture. Construction is not yet complete, but we need to go there and learn. There is knowledge to pick regarding feeding of the animals, uh, dairy, most especially. A lot to learn from there and how to manage even the waste uh, for getting biogas, fertilizers and the like. So good lessons to pick from there. We don't have now to send farmers outside the country. But we have now this facility where we can pick these lessons. And uh, it's going to be open to people to make an arrangement to go there and really learn. There's also processing of these uh, products. So once it is complete, uh, we would like to be trained from that area. Another clarification, uh, one of the questions came out that we need to partner with the Nabrik, Naro and the like. Let me make it very clear to the people who are here. These are agencies of the ministry. We all work together. Naro is part of Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries. Nagrik is part of Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries. NAD is the same. We also have Koktu. We have DDA. You understand? We have coffee. We have cotton. These are colleagues we work together. Only that they've been given a chance to specialize in certain areas. For example, coffee specializes in coffee. Cotton specializes in cotton. But we are colleagues. We work all together. So when I hear that we need to partner, which I don't know which kind of partnership we are talking about. Because we are one, and let me put this in perspective uh, before maybe we begin answering the questions. I will start with Ben. Ben Twine was talking of pushing for livestock. Uh, we mentioned that you have stopped blaming each other, and you want full support from the ministry, uh, specifically for the livestock sector, and really you want a commitment from the ministry. Really, I want to assure you that there is no sector that actually has been left behind. There might be apparent, you know, uh, appearance that we are not giving support to livestock, but really a lot of effort is being put in livestock. But we are also improving. The challenge has always been the budget for the sector, but the budgets have started improving and we are looking for more. To see that we provide much, much more for the sector. The model I talked about here, we are really pushing a lot. When we talk to, about poor service handling for the grains, I came back and I said the focus is for feeds. Feeds for fish, feeds for animals, and poultry. We really want to stop importing these feeds. We want to manufacture them here and even further export. You must have heard me mention in the beginning that our focus is for food security, increasing household incomes, and increasing exports. That focus is there. And we want really to stop the export of raw materials. So then, I assure you, our support is there and the focus is there. But you are going to be seeing much, much more of this involvement. We are improving the markets for livestock. We have a project which is there. We are also introducing some of the mobile facilities to help mainly the cattle corridor, uh, mobile abattoirs, and other improvements in that area. In fact, as one of the initiatives we put in the cattle corridor, to improve on the pastures, brought us trouble with parliament and the like. Because we focused on improving the pastures and by improving pastures for the animals, we needed the tractors. So the first lot of tractors we brought specifically went to the cooperatives which were meant to improve pasture. Pasture for the cattle corridor, but also to, to sell out the pasture. But that brought us trouble. And so we said, okay, let us handle the entire country in bits, whereby we're not going to go into this trouble. But there is focus, like I'm telling you. 
that is one of the initiatives among its many. Maybe we don't know how to make noise about them, but that is a strategic initiative. We have a problem with feed. If we improve pastures, whereby the animals can feed on those improved pastures, hey, and also sell out to the smallholders who can't uh, grow these pastures, or who don't have the land to have the pastures. That is strategic. Zero grazing pays, and we're also promoting it. One of the things I didn't say is we're also pushing forward for model farms at every sub-county. These model farms, one of the things we are pushing is at least an animal or two. Land, land is, is decreasing each and every day, and land fragmentation is here with us, but we're encouraging people to stop it. The environment I talked about, with an animal, with somebody with a small piece of land, if they can grow crops for food, they have at least two animals. They can be able to process biogas, whereby they are cooking. They move from the firewood, from the, cha the, the chapel, and use biogas for cooking, for example. And they already have manure to use on their farm. Some of these crops can be eaten and also even for sale at the small holding scale. But directly, you are aware, if you look after the animal very well, you have the right, you have the right uh, animal, the right genetics, you've got the right feeds, you control the diseases. An animal can give you money daily throughout the whole year. And this is what we are promoting as government, to see that we start at sub-county level. Then we expand to all the farmers, encouraging them at least to have an animal and the model we are talking about, the four-acre model we are talking about. That's the idea behind it. Because there's also, there are also environmental issues to protect the environment. And we're also pushing to see that we, we reduce further the taxes for gas, so that gas becomes cheaper than chuck. There won't be need for people to continue cutting our trees. We shall at least reduce. We shall not be able to remove, but we shall reduce. And we're really pushing to see that gas and even the suppliers increase in number, whereby we make it irrelevant for these cattle. And by the way, the chapel use is mainly in the cities. If we can stop it ourselves here, we stop and we say we're not going to use it, then we are contributing to the environment. Sorry, I'll be moving into other things, which maybe I was unable to talk about when I was uh, addressing you. Uh, allow me, since this is an opportunity, let me just go into other issues. Then we had Anita from Kemifa. Thank you, Anita. I know I'm supposed to I'm supposed to visit you, but I've not had that time. Kemifa has really supported us. Uh, when they came here in '98, I was uh, in the fish industry, and uh, really they worked so hard with us. Uh, they've been able to support us to see that at least fish does not have the issues we have today for example, with the hot culture. So we thank you so much. And for some of you who wish to work with them, they are really very good uh, in what they are doing. And Europe believes in their services. So they are a model. She asked about whether there is a intention in enforcing uh, for testing of some of the feeds, making it mandatory. But I wish to mention that at least the feeds policy was approved by cabinet. Uh, we are going into uh, the law, which is supposed to be done, and we believe we shall be, once we finish the processes, we shall be enforcing uh, with that policy. <clears throat> but there are certain fundamentals we have to put in place before we go into enforcing. For example, when you heard me talk about processing quality animal feeds, this infrastructure is not here in the country. But with the promotion, attention to it, into agro-processing, there will be an alternative. To stop people from using what they are using currently when there is no alternative, it may not be a very sensible kind of decision, but I know with the time this is coming. Customers are demanding for quality products. The people are demanding for quality. They are shunning these poor quality items. We know with the time that will come with the efforts and investment you are going to put in, this will come. And I know not long from now, these facilities are going to be producing because uh, the funders are really much, much more willing even to release the money. Only that there are certain processes we must follow 
to see that uh, you go through that. There is a freelancer who asked freelance. He said freelance. I didn't get the name. He said freelance. So I wrote freelance. I'm Albert. Albert Mukundani. Ah, Albert. Sorry, I'll not call you sir. Let <laughs> me go with Albert. Albert is okay. You can also call me Pius. Pius. But I didn't introduce myself. My name is Pius Wakan Kasanya. So you can call me Pius. Don't go into those things of sir and whatever. <laughs> Animals are dying. What can we do with the areas where we have uh, no water? You talked about looking beyond honey, uh, promoting indigenous knowledge, then uh, glorifying our neighbors who are going above us. Now, again, I'll combine this with the answer on water food production. As one of the focus areas in this year and the coming years, you must have had water for production is key. And this policy, we are running it alongside our colleagues in the Ministry of Water and Environment. Water for production is not only for the Ministry of Agriculture, we are working together and we are moving together because our things are very much interrelated. What we are doing today in areas which have been selected, which are hardly hit, we are digging dams, valley dams. We are also digging valley tanks. I'll give you an example of Karamoja, which is every year known to be hit by this challenge. In this financial year and the coming financial year, we are putting up three dams. And when we talk of dams, these are lakes, not simple, simple dams you see here huge dams, we are already constructing them. And in these areas, in the Songola area and the Katokol, we have also put dams. Only that, our facilities are not that big for us to show an impact immediately. When this challenge came up, already in the Songola, we went and put up water facilities with water bowsers to mitigate the challenge which was there immediately. And I believe for the people who are on the ground, you must have seen that impact. Already we dug up facilities to solve that issue immediately, but for the long term, we are putting up dams to solve this issue of water. And it's not that we were not working in this area. What we have is simply not enough. We also have a section which helps you, the farmers, individually to come and hire these facilities we have an arm which is subsidized heavily. If you have a farm and you need to put a tank or a dam onto your farm, you can come and hire. Because we are less than half the market price. Only that the demand is too much. So many applications are lined up, but many farmers have benefited. But we are also doing that alongside the community kind of facilities for the, to stop these challenges we've been having. I'm sure now Karamoja is not having that issue we had before of animals dying just like that. So we are sorting it out. We believe in the near future, the issue of water is going to be forgotten. Including, by the way, not only animals, even humans. And when we talk of the environment, there are some of the things we are trying to mitigate. Because we wouldn't be in this situation, Uganda is endowed. People come here, other countries which are doing very well, they, are, they don't have what we have here. So let us all work together, the private sector with government, to see that we mitigate some of these challenges we are looking at. Now, looking beyond honey, yes, I do agree. I didn't come with my team for APR, but uh, maybe at the opportune moment we shall talk more about that area and the initiatives which are in that area. Really, that's an area which is still virgin that needs to be looked into for prosperity. Cancelling our neighbors. Now, I alluded to this point when I was speaking, maybe I didn't bring it out as counseling. As we do business out there, let us try to involve the communities where we are operating. We build an ecosystem whereby you make sure your neighbors benefit, but for you to benefit even much, much more. Maybe I'll have a day to come and I train about this. If I have a farm in an area, and I make sure I have a program to devote my neighbors, for example, by saying, every year I'll be giving out two hyphas to my neighbors, training them how to look after this animal. 
and I buy the products from them. Maybe from what they are selling to me, I should be recovering my cost of the hyphen. Those people will look after you. And even the thieves who are coming to steal from you, they will protect you. They will not, because they know they are benefiting from you. And if you have a processing facility, for example, you pack the milk, you do the yogurts, you do whatever, and you are selling, and you are giving them a, a, a good price, you don't rip them. Our economy has been riddled with middlemen. But for you, if you've decided to invest in that, put up a processing facility, help the neighbors to develop and supply you. They look after you and you will not see a thief. Believe me. Because they will see the value of you being there. And they will keep you. And really, one day I want to organize you to come and talk about this. The issue of theft, the issue of theft can be sorted by helping the neighbors. We need to get out of this element of I'm in a community for myself, every penny and whatever. You know, you know, we need to work with the communities. And by doing that, we are not going to allow this criminality to happen. Dr. Kassiria, mm. government policy on theft. Yes. Traders and uh, whatever. Uh, when I was delivering my attention, I didn't dwell so much on uh, agriculture credit and insurance, but I believe somebody will. But again, on top of what I'm talking about, how do we work with the communities where we are? To start with the community policing, because the people who steal from you normally are not from very far. Either they are part of the family, the workers, or people around the community where you are living. How do I change these people to be responsible to my business? That is the beginning point. Government will try as much as possible to see that we provide more security right now. But the capacity we have might be a little bit challenging to provide specific security needs to individual farmers. But like we are saying, we need to go back also to community policing. In terms of government, uh, compensating you as an individual, I think this is something that needs to be looked into. The detail can be looked into. And uh, maybe not now, I can have an engagement with you at a later stage. Uh, and I understand the issue, maybe I'm not answering it very well. But in terms of security, government is trying its best to provide security for the entire country. Compensation will encourage farmers to go into agriculture insurance at the same time. In the event such things happen, the insurance can come in to help, but government uh, can also come in to help in some cases whereby uh, it is really very hard, but again, it also goes with the budgeting and whatever. At the moment, uh, this budget is not available, uh, but yes, let me look into the issue and I understand it, maybe you can have a, a different discussion. But I can hear you, many farmers are having this challenge, uh, it is a problem. Really, we need to find a solution to it. But like I talk today, security has greatly improved, especially around the urban areas. You can see the initiatives which have been put in place. The community which had propped up has started reducing, but we need to do much, much more, especially with the manpower that we have. And since I'm not in charge of security, let me not talk much <laughs> on their behalf. Uh, at the opportune moment, I will invite the people in charge of security to come and help me to answer this question. <laughs> Robert Serwanga uh, asked whether I'm aware maize is now at 1,300 shillings. Uh, yes, Robert, I'm aware and it is a concern, but we, we are getting a solution to this which I've talked about for a long time, this is going to disappear. And in fact, when the bumper issue came up, we knew and we started communicating that let farmers continue planting. But farmers move very fast. But with the facilities we are putting in place, this challenge will go. This challenge will go and we want to stabilize prices. The challenges we are facing are going to really disappear. Now, you also talked about an issue of our neighbors closing uh, the border for the eggs. Uh, this issue has been working on it for quite some time. And for people like me, I will tell you, 
we've had this issue from the time we had an issue with avian flu. Maybe I can explain to the community here to understand what it was. Some time back, there was an issue of mad cow disease in Europe. And our colleagues keep on importing beef and beef products from Europe, which caused a problem in our neighbors. And as Uganda, we said, OK, let us close our borders to these products, which affected their market. And this plan has been on for long. They've been trying for us to open and were unable to open the borders because they were unable to satisfy us that they had fulfilled the requirements which made the borders to be closed. Little did we know they were looking at when to close the borders for us. <laughs> so when avian flu came up, they moved very fast. We moved all over to see that we showed them that we are doing all the best and whatever. They closed our borders. When they said they are going to open, they really opened for uh, a, a few factories which have uh, actually sources from they originate from there. <laughs> we cried, they brought up so many reasons and whatever, not saying why these borders were closed. So we had to go into discussions. Let us get onto the table and understand the problem. Beans can tell you the story. So we've been negotiating, these negotiations have been on Honorable Minister. This has been going on for years. To hear the President announce the work that has gone beyond there, it has been a lot. Until we had to agree, we even did video conferences because the meetings were becoming many. We were in Russia, we were in Nairobi, we are all over. And we have these issues. Because beyond the borders in Kenya, all the other neighbors also closed because Kenya closed. And the trading that has been happening, including the eggs, is not known. It is illegal. People have found a way of, found a way of sending these eggs chicken products to Kenya. But now it has been opened, borders have been opened, we've opened for the beef and the beef products for Kenya, and the borders are open. If this issue of the eggs is still there, let us know, such as a point of concern, but the borders are open. The president's announced, we agreed technically, so the announcement was done, we are, we are in the region, and we stand much, much more to benefit by trading with each other than closing these borders. So the borders are open. That issue was in the past. It was there, but it's not there anymore. If you get to hear that the borders are closed, for anybody, let me know. Call me. My number is available. I will come. But uh, as far as we are concerned, the borders are open. We welcome the products, and they also welcome our products. Mehdi Mwiri from Engineering Solutions. Talked of agriculture financing, affordable to farmers, yes. We are really working hard to see that cost of production for the farmers gets really down. And all this also goes into mechanization, even water for production and the like. Yes, agriculture credit is not yet uh, very much popularized by, by the banks. But believe me, once we get organized in the model we talked about, they will come running. I'll tell you, in Kalanga, where we have the oil palm, banks want to come and fight for those farmers. Unfortunately, they are the ones who came up during the time of difficulty, <coughs> ring fenced. Do you understand? But even these are areas they are coming because we are getting much more organized. Unfortunately, some of our initiatives don't show results immediately, but they will come. And even we want to push them even lower than 12%. This is our interest. As we speak today, Ministry of Finance is busy crafting how this is going to work. We are working with them, but let me also not comment on their behalf. But the Ministry of Finance is working on agriculture credit and insurance for the farmers. But you must have heard me in the model talk about it very seriously. That is going to be resolved. Let me not preempt what they are working on. But bear with us. If you can be able to get somebody who can finance at affordable rates, yeah, let us get there. And most of these finances we are talking about, as a government, we try to get the best interest rates possible with the initiatives we are putting up to see that our people really get out of poverty. But we need you in the PPP arrangements that we are putting up as a private sector. Because as government, we are not going to run these facilities. Uh, the time taken to approve, like I said, that is being sorted out. Uh, Halima. Halima, mama, pig. 
Mama Pig, I need to visit you. I have a date. Mama, is she there? I need to come and I visit you. I know you exist. I'll come and maybe we talk much, much more about this challenge. Again, a lot of effort has been put into infrastructure development. Uh, we have not reached everywhere like uh, you would like us to be, but initiatives are in place to get there. I can't give a solution immediately. But let us encourage people to go into solutions like even solar to help because today solar is getting cheaper and uh, it's getting more perfected. There are cooling solutions for solar, lighting and the like uh, before government gets there. At least electricity has reached each and every sub-county headquarters where people can begin tapping. But as you know, our budget is not that big, but I know infrastructure is working very hard. There are initi initiatives for removing uh, charges for connection and the like. Let us explore them. We may not be able to reach everywhere at the same time, but I know this development, this development is coming. We have reached a stage whereby we are not what it used to be in the past. Water for production, I think I heard so much on this question. Let me not repeat what it is, and I know there is a lot. And we feel you. Really, we really want to do everything that we want to do if we had the money and the capacity that we would require. Thank you very much for listening to me. I wish you wonderful deliberations. Thank you very much, Mr. Pierce. Uh, if, you, if you all have your programs, agendas, and you also look at your watch, we are already late for our tea, and the people, of course, in the kitchen don't know what is happening here. So I'm going to request that we break now for our tea, but I'm going to request that we reduce the amount of time we drink the tea. I hope those people can serve the tea very quickly so that we can come back in 15 minutes. So 15 minutes, please, please come back and we resume. With that, I want to thank the peers and uh, hope and pray that if cabinet finishes early, you can come back, we shall still be here. Thank you, Mr. Fires, welcome to the We'll see you soon. Welcome back to this session. We are 
very, very behind in terms of our program, and we have many very interesting presentations from our investors, and we really want to listen and hear from them. But at the same time, we also want you to benefit and therefore give us your feedback. Uh, all the presenters are here. What we've done is we are making uh, uh, some adjustments on the program. Uh, Mr. William Asiko from the, uh, from the African Union um, Development Agency uh, will briefly take us through the country of the business partnership framework because the, our theme today is basically working together. And it's, we see this framework as an important one. But after him, a series of investors, some local, uh, others foreign direct investors, will give us their perspectives in terms of what they're doing, but also in terms of partnerships that they see with government, with you, the private sector. And then after that, we could have a, a, a very good discussion. We apologize to all, to all of them because we had told them they had 20 minutes make their presentations and now we are squeezing them to, to, to reduce the time. But they are here, you're all here. Uh, let's make it work within the next two hours. After that, we will have uh, our, our lunch. So William, over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Right, it's two minutes to 12, so I think I'm still justified to say good morning. Um, but as you heard from Edward, we are running way behind schedule. Many of you have got uh, flights to catch, perhaps other meetings to attend. So we're gonna to try to be very quick with this session. In a sense, this session is one of the key parts of the engagement that we've been having over the past two days, because what we're going to do now is after hearing the articulation of what government is doing, after hearing you know, the policies that are being put in place, the level of support that government is prepared to offer the private sector, we want to hear now from the private sector itself. And uh, we want to see where the two can meet together uh, in order to move forward. My name is William Asiko. Those of you who were with us yesterday uh, for the CEO breakfast uh, will remember that I spoke briefly about uh, an initiative called the Country Agribusiness Partnership Framework. I actually had a full presentation on that Country Agribusiness Partnership Framework, um, but I was unable to make it yesterday during, uh, due, due to a shortage of time. And uh, the same, same uh, misfortune or perhaps fortune depending on what side you look at it, has befallen me again today. But nevertheless, I really do want to thank, uh, start by thanking uh, our officials from the ministry, uh, starting with uh, the Director Stroke Calm Commissioner uh, of Animal Industry, who have articulated what I think is one of the best policies around supporting private sector that I have seen. Now, as part of the African Union Development Agency, obviously we are rolling out these country agribusiness partnership frameworks all over Africa. And we're doing 15 countries in 2019. Uh, we, we are in Malawi a month ago where we launched it there, and Uganda is the second country in which we are doing it. We are working very much on a demand basis with the governments and private sector. So you can see that if countries, Uganda is up there with the countries being done first, it means that there is a great demand for a framework that brings the public and private sector together. Now, where did this come from? And what those of you who are here yesterday will remember that I spoke about a meeting I was invited to um, in Brussels in 2017, and it was the European Dairy Association, a multi-stakeholder platform that brought together all the, dairy, the key dairy uh, value chain actors in Europe. And their struck, the, the meeting had been called in Brussels by the EDA to discuss their strategy for increasing their exports to Africa. A two-day meeting, all the stakeholders were there, they had government in the room, they had EU officials in the room, they had farmers, they had marketers, 
they had everybody who was involved in the value chain sitting in the room talking about Africa for two days. Now, what surprised me is that, apart from myself, there was not a single African in the room. <laughs> not one. And there was no single African policymaker or private sector member. I was not invited as an African, although I could not leave behind my Africanness. <laughs> I was invited as a representative of the private sector in Europe that is doing business in Africa, which is what Grow Africa does, we represent the private sector. So that's how I was, I was in this room. And the strategies were very serious about how they intend to double their exports to Africa in five years' time. And they had countries which they prioritized. Uganda was one of them. And it struck me that I had no doubt in my mind that they were going to be successful. Why? Because everybody who had any decision to make about the dairy industry was sitting in that room. Anybody who had anything to do with that value chain was sitting in that room. And whenever an issue arose, the individual responsible for that particular issue stood up and addressed it on the spot. The other thing that I took away from that meeting was the champion of the dairy industry in Europe is actually Ireland, a country of less than 5 million people is exporting $5 billion worth of dairy products out of Ireland. This is what they sell outside of Europe. $5 billion. And how did they get there? Again, it's quite simple. Every stakeholder involved in the value chain works together for the same purpose. And so I came back uh, to Johannesburg, where you know our offices are based, and I began to think, what is the challenge that we have in Africa in transforming agriculture? Because the director talked about the uh, Common Agricultural Advancement uh, Development Program, CADAP, which is a pan-African structure, framework, for agricultural development on the continent. We have a single framework for all African countries to drive their agricultural transformation. And it's been in place for nearly 15 years. And yet our agriculture continues to stagnate. What is the challenge? When I talk to the private sector, and I think you will hear from them today, they are very keen to invest. There is no shortage of private sector individuals and companies that want to invest in, in agricultural value chains. As we've heard from government today, and when I hear from governments all over, they too are looking for the private sector. So what ails the discussions between the two? And I just have a couple of points to say about that. The first thing is, although we had really good policies uh, this morning, articulated uh, very well by the director and, and the PS, and I must say in his absence that I, I thought the, that you know anybody who can articulate government policy for 45 minutes without reading a single note uh, knows what he's talking about. And I, and I think we really need to give him was, I've never seen that. Um, you know, most uh, senior people in government will have a prepared speech that somebody else has written, and uh, you know, he not only did he give that speech, but he also took questions, which I thought was was really, really impressive. But however good your policies are, judging by the questions that were asked, they cannot address every single issue that the private sector faces. There is no country, whether it's mature or emerging, that can address every single issue. That's the first thing. We've also seen today that some issues affect certain value chains, and some issues do not affect the same value chain. So you might have a challenge that is there in one value chain, it's not there in another value chain. How do you have that discussion that allows you to address specific issues to a specific investor. Third, 
Again, as we heard today from the answers that the, the uh, PS gave, not all issues affecting agriculture sit within the Ministry of Agriculture. There's a requirement for interdepartmental, interministerial activity. There are things that are affected by Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Trade, I mean, the issues of border closures are even ministries of foreign affairs. You know, how do you get that internal uh, uh, alignment? Taking all these things into account, let me just finish my remarks by talking about the country agribusiness partnership framework, because that is precisely what the country agribusiness partnership framework tries to do. In short, we call it CAPEF. Uh, it was developed out of many experiences. I myself, spent 20 years in the Coca-Cola company, working across Africa, trying to build the Coca-Cola business by acquiring other businesses on the continent. And so I knew how difficult it was to try to grow your business in many African countries uh, when you're in the private sector. I really understand the pain. And to see the Uganda government being so approachable to the private sector is really a joy to me because, trust me, in the days that we were doing it, it, it was always closed doors and uh, missed appointments and so on. So again, I really do want to recognize this work that you can have senior officials spend the whole day listening to the challenges of the private sector. So I had that experience. And I realized that private sector investment is affected by many issues, like some of the ones we've talked today. But one of the most important is how do you engage government and make sure that you can hold each other mutually accountable? So the private sector investor says, I want to invest in this value chain, maybe poultry, it may be pig, it may be beef or dairy, uh, but I need government to do the following for me. It could be the provision of land, it could be the provision of um, roads, electricity, and um, I'm not saying this specifically about Uganda. This could be, you know, any country. But, you know, how does the private sector know that if I invest my $10 million, that the government will maintain its commitment? How does the government get comfort that if they meet their obligation, that the private sector will actually invest as they say that they do? These are some of the challenges that the country agribusiness partnership framework tries to do. It starts off with what we call a CAPEF Secretariat. Now, the CAPEF Secretariat is the starting point for this engagement. And we do not advise local stakeholders or governments where to house the CAPEF Secretariat. But the only thing I would say is that the CAPEF Secretariat needs to be friendly and approachable by the private sector. The private sector needs to feel that if they go to the CAPEF Cap 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 Secretariat with their issues, <coughs> that those issues will be solved and taken seriously. So the CAPEF Secretariat could be housed in a public institution or in a private institution. In some countries, the government has actually institutionalized the Secretariat and created a, an institution that works specifically for agribusiness. This is an, a pro, uh, an investment promotion center. It works specifically for agribusiness because of the challenges in agribusiness. The CAPES Secretariat looks at each investment on a value chain basis and understands the challenges that that investor would, 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 would face and pulls together the different actors in the public sector as well as farmers, as well as civil society to come together to make this investment effective. Out of that interaction, we get what is called a term sheet. That term sheet lists the obligations of all the actors in that particular invest required to make that particular investment effective. This term sheet is then surfaced up to the permanent secretary's level. Again, it's an interministerial permanent uh, secretary's committee that is also brings in private sector CEOs and representatives of alliances like UAA to give executive level approval to the term sheet. And then thirdly, once that is approved at the executive level, it is sent to a council of ministers. 
and the Council of Ministers gives that investment a, a, with the political blessing, if you want. The idea is that it is likely, if this is working properly and effectively, that there will be 10, 15, 20, maybe in the future 100 such term sheets being approved uh, you know, on a monthly basis in cabinet so that we can really work towards transformation. I'm very happy to say that we've been working with the government of Uganda and with UAA over the last 18 months to get CAPEF uh, launched here in Uganda and it is now ready uh, for launch and within the next few weeks you'll be hearing announcements uh, about that. So that's all I'm going to say about CAPEF today. Um, you know, there'll be further engagements, um, but I really do appreciate the time and the work that has been put in place uh, by, by UAA and, uh, and the government to get us to this uh, particular point. Thank you very much. So now I'll remove my hat uh, as the representative of, of NEPAD and, and the African Union Development Agency talking about CAPEF and move to the next section of our uh, agenda today, which is to hear from the private sector themselves. Um, CAPEF, uh, and I think it's appropriate that I should do this because CAPEF obviously is about bringing uh, both <coughs> actors together to speak in a, a frank and effective manner. And so for me to sort of moderate this session, I'm going to ask each of our private sector members again to be very brief um, I remember when I worked in the Coca-Cola company, I used to work in the headquarters in Atlanta. And the headquarters has got 26 floors. And the elevator from the ground floor to the 26th floor took exactly one and a half minutes. And we used to be told, if you have a business idea and you walk into that elevator and you meet the CEO of the Coca-Cola company, you would have what because his office is on the 26th floor, obviously. You would have one and a half minutes to present your business idea and for him to say yes or no. <laughs> so many of you will have heard that phrase, elevator pitch. So what I'm asking each one of you today, I'm not giving you one and a half minutes, but I'm asking you to focus on your elevator pitch. What is it that you want this audience to take away what are the partnership opportunities you're looking for, what are the public sector commitments you would like to see that you haven't already seen in what has been presented, and what other things would make you more successful. I think those are the things that I would like you to focus on. Um, we will try to give everybody an equal time. I'll try to be very strict with time, so that uh, you know, if you if you get to uh, the ten minute mark and you haven't given your elevator pitch, then you you have missed the boat. All right. So <clears throat> I will go according to the, the the list we have in our agenda, and I will start with uh, Mr. Lionel Marumahoko, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Dairy and Beef Global Solutions. Now, Lionel and I were fortunate both to work in the Coca-Cola company for many years. So we've had experience in Africa. I'm not starting with him because we work together. The agenda wasn't done by myself. But Lionel, please come up and uh, give us your elevator pitch uh, so that uh, we, can, we can move forward. Let's give him a round of applause as he comes. say that, uh, you know, I, I must confess that I'm very much encouraged by the energy and the dialogue and discussion that uh, transpired this morning. Uh, it, it makes me very excited to be, to be here today. Uh, I'm not too sure about the last hand clap you gave me, uh, but certainly the, the dialogue this morning was, uh, was remarkable. 
I, I stand before you this afternoon as uh, the CEO of uh, DBGS. Uh, and again, you know, the description of DBGS is actually on the screen. What we are in a nutshell, we are farmers, we are investors, and something I need to emphasize uh, upfront is that one of our prerequisites, obviously, uh, as investors, is that whatever we do, from day one, we have to bring our communities on board. That is a prerequisite to our business model, because without the communities, uh, you don't have a sustainable business. Another thing that's very important to put out there is that we are not consultants, so we actually are uh, farmers. Now, I just wanted to kind of uh, get started on what is it we bring to the table as, as, as DBGS. And clearly, obviously, we want to be uh, a leading developer of farms across, across Africa, um, and we are very open in the fact that we, we want to make sure that we have the best in class farms uh, that we actually build. And the basis of our, our strength is actually the, the know-how uh, and the technology that comes out of New Zealand. That is the basis of, uh, of what we actually bring to the table. And this is really around a pasture-based system and also uh, a very strong genetics. I know I've had dialogue with a few of you who talk about some of the genetics that are here in Uganda, but I think uh, you know we also bring uh, fairly uh, solid genetics as well, which are very specific for tropical regions. So I think there's a lot of synergies based on what's happening in Uganda and what we can actually uh, bring to the table. And if you look at our approach, is really to look at how can we look at investment opportunities that are greenfield and also that are brownfield as well. So we're very open uh, to that. And the reason why we're here, uh, to go back to William's earlier point, is we're looking to collaborate with different stakeholders that are relevant to what we want to accomplish. And as I listen through to all the conversations that were taking place this morning, it's pretty much virtually most of you are, are potential collaborators for us for what we, we actually want to achieve uh, in this market. What you have in front of you is the team that I represent. Um, and the, the point that I just want to emphasize is that out of this team, there's over 50 years experience in, in beef and dairy uh, across across the world. And not only that, there's also over 60 years experience in general management on the African continent that actually brings to the table. So there's a wealth of experience that we actually bring to the table. And, and obviously that's uh, the credentials of the, of the rest of the team that we, that we have. Now, if I can just shift gears and, and kind of go into the details and, and speak about what are the leverage points that we bring using the technology out of New Zealand. And again, it goes back to the fact around intensive mm -hmm. pasture-based uh, systems that we actually bring. The, the key aspect around pasture-based <coughs> systems is really around low cost. Because quite frankly, milk is a commodity. The key thing is you have to produce the milk with quality, but at the lowest cost. And I'll talk a little bit more about New Zealand, and I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with New Zealand. But New Zealanders are some of the, they are the top dairy market in the world. And when you speak to the farmers in New Zealand, uh, the dairy farmers at least, they don't refer themselves as, as dairy farmers they say to you very frankly and clearly that they grow grass. That's what they do, because that's where the money is. So that's what we actually bring uh, to the table. Another key aspect is obviously around R&D and technology efficiency. And when you think about us being bullish in Africa, about leapfrogging, uh, how we actually develop our systems, it's very important that we start to embrace technology and that will allow us to leapfrog whatever we come up with. And one key aspect that we also bring to the table are systems and processes that allows you to do that. We have the right software that we can actually bring to the table, but most importantly, there is elements around capability that we can actually bring from New Zealand to build our local capability as well for us to be able to execute this on our own. As, as I speak about all this, another point of connection here 
is how do we partner with local universities, how do we partner with local institutions for us to be able to build this capability and ensure that the capability actually remains on, on the continent, uh, particularly in uh, Uganda. So, as, as I mentioned earlier on, is for us to achieve our vision um, on the continent, uh, and I make particular reference here to Uganda, is that as DBGS, we have to be an integrator. We have to be a solution pro pro uh, provider. And we have to actually be in a place where we have the ability to bring all the actors of the industry together. And again, I refer to New Zealand, a small little country uh, sitting at the far end of the world, but they produce 3% of the world's milk. And out of this country, they produce on an annual basis, enough milk to feed over 100 million people. And the question is, why can't we do it in Uganda? And we are going to do it in Uganda, and we should do it in Uganda, and that's the attitude that we should have uh, around that. They actually have more cows than people. <laughs> they have more cows than people. We're talking about some of the land issues earlier on, about how do we manage the land. For those of you who've been to New Zealand, or, or those of you who plan to go to New Zealand, one of the things that you find is that even though they have more cows than people, when you drive down the countryside where they have all these dairy farms, you can never know or even get the feeling that there are more cows than people. But it comes back to how they actually manage the land. So there's a lot of expertise that we can learn from them that we can bring to, to this uh, part of the world. But most importantly is, the attitude is that if New Zealand can do it, why can't we do it in Uganda uh, and be, also be in the same space? <laughs> if you start to think about what does this all look like, what you have in front of you is essentially the model. We coming in as investors and we see ourselves as a Trojan horse or a beachhead that allows to build scale. For you to make significant difference in any venture, particularly in dairy, you've got to have scale. And you've got to have an organization that is enormous pressure to actually succeed. And that can be a catalyst for success in any market. And as I mentioned earlier on, supported by that, there's a prerequisite that from day one, you bring the communities on board. Not only the communities, but we also bring all the other actors on board. You need to bring the off-takers on board. You need to bring the government on board. You need to pretty much bring in the research centers, NGOs, everyone has to come to on board. And that way, we're able to actually build scale and make a significant difference uh, in, uh, in all these ventures. So it's very, very important that we think of this as an ecosystem that can actually be able to help us drive value in the respective market. And that's the model that we are, are, are sticking to. And I'm glad to know that uh, the PAC made it also very clear that it's really about an ecosystem for us to be able to make progress uh, in these ventures. <laughs> and as I mentioned again, we bring basic class, technical expertise, in-depth knowledge of Africa, and leading investment track record, and we also have a very robust pipeline across, across the continent. We've also done a lot of work, not only in Africa, we've done a lot of work in Latin America, and again, after the meeting, I'm more than happy to share with you some of the experiences in Colombia, and Ecuador, and all those markets, and I'm hoping in the very near future, we can also have experiences that we talk about of the work that we'll do in, in Uganda. Just as a side, before I step down and, and hand over to the next presenter, I just want to talk about an area that we are very passionate about is DBGS. And this is an area around overgrazing. It's not just a problem, I'm sure, in Uganda, but it's a problem across the continent. And I've put up one example here that says that if you look at communal grazing in Ethiopia as an example, they do as little as three tons of matter per hectare. And what we have actually proved in Colombia and Ecuador is that you can actually move it up to 20, 20 tons, which is fairly significant, by actually addressing those basic fundamentals. There are other examples of models that you can actually use, which is called a milk share where the government owns the land, and you bring on board farmers that do the milk sharing, and then the sharing of resources. Again, it's another example that I'd love to chat with you, for those of you who have interest, uh, on how that can work. And this has worked for four years in, uh, 
in, uh, in New Zealand, and I'm sure it can actually work in this part of the world. I'm not so sure what happened to that, but essentially, in summary, what I want to say is that for us to succeed in data, we need a Trojan horse that can consolidate and bring in the communities on board, and we need to have local sourcing, right? We need to have local sourcing with offtake agreements, and we need to have discussions around the effect on, on land. For as, as us as investors to come and invest on land, uh, to invest in a country, it's very important that uh, the government realizes that our investment is not short term, it's long term. So discussions around land tenure is also very critical as well. So for me, those are the three key points that are relevant and pertinent for me. Uh, and uh, I thank you all for, for listening and uh, uh, looking forward to working with you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lionel, for being uh, brief and succinct. Um, as you heard there, I'm actually timing everybody. So as soon as you hear the little alarm go off, you know that your 10 minutes are up. What I'll ask everybody to do is that if you have any questions, uh, please note them down, write them down. We will have a Q&A, um, a moderated Q&A where the, uh, the questions can be answered uh, after we've given everybody an opportunity to, to present. So we'll continue with our, our program. Uh, the next, to give an overview of the beef uh, industry, we have Mr. Alistair Taylor, uh, who is a technical advisor with the government uh, today on sustainable beef production. Alistair, where are you? I'm here. All right. Um, uh, as soon as the first word comes out of your mouth, I'm starting to time. <laughs> Oh, he's just finding the presentation. Uh, no, that's not the first word. The first word of your presentation. <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak. Um, I'm just one member of a, of a team based in the Ministry of Agriculture, and unfortunately, I do have to rush off after I give this presentation, but then come back later on at the lunchtime engagement which I couldn't get out of. So uh, thank you to the organizers for shifting me a little bit sooner and so I will keep to, uh, the promise of keeping time. If you want to know more about the program then there's some of these brochures on the back table and my contact details will also come up at the end of the presentation. I think for ourselves we're like the PPP part of the people up here because we're not private sector, I'm not private sector, I am government although personally I'm a consultant so I guess I am private sector. Um, so it's a privilege to be standing up amongst uh, these, uh, these distinguished private sector investors to uh, give a little presentation on the beef sector. Um, some of it has already been said by our director when she gave her um, presentation this morning of all the livestock. Um, but we see that there's an increasing demand as Uganda becomes um, more affluent, more urbanized, we were bound to see an increase in meat consumption. We're seeing that already, and that will continue to happen. Here we see the difference between uh, North America, Asia, and Africa, and the proportion of vegetable food and meat food, and cereal food. And you see meat in Africa is, is very small at the moment, but it's going to increase, it will increase, uh, due to rising urbanization, rising uh, incomes, Productivity growth is slower under developed value chains. And as a consequence, there will be a gap in uh, developing. And all of these are the reasons why the European Union decided, together with the government of Uganda, to invest in the beef industry. Yes, we're just one small part of livestock in Uganda, as we've been hearing about, but we feel it's an important part and a, a part with opportunity. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. But, uh, yeah. yeah, so we can see that as we grow richer, we eat more milk, more meat. You can see there a useful graph. I hope this presentation can be shared with people at the end. So this is the way forward. I want to read this. As demand increases, it creates a vacuum and a potential risk as well as an economic opportunity. The overall way for Uganda will be to increase outputs of the main, main food products in which Uganda as a natural comparative advantage and to strengthen the post-farm value chains and logistics to bring them to the market more efficiently. And that's what our project is trying to do with beef. And there's others with other sectors as well. And we're very, although we're located within the Ministry of Agriculture, 
we are very much private sector driven and private sector responsive. And that's sometimes quite hard within the ministry. It's a bit of a change of thinking. It's been coming gradually, 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 and it's gaining strength. And we're just part of that. So although we're located there, don't be afraid to come and visit us, to see us, and uh, to talk more to us. Although we're in the ministry, we're open to, to all visitors. Um, when I was following my guidance from Edward about what to talk about, he said, bring out the story. So to me, this is the very, very summarized the beef story. You, many of you Ugandans here, you know much more than me. But there's a strong cattle keeping tradition in Uganda. And that's an advantage to you private sector investors. People love their animals. But there is a cultural and uh, numbers focus rather than a commercial focus in many cases. Um, there are a few dedicated beef producers. Many are involved in dairy and it's the offtakes of that dairy or the sick animals coming out of that dairy which are being sold off. Or there's a family emergencies that come along and they sell off the animals. Our feeding is not maximized. Very interesting on the last presentation. Um, pest and disease control still has a lot to be accomplished as we heard again from the director this morning. There's FMD and quarantine which is a serious constraint to private sector, beef sector players. And uh, then we have the issue of animal welfare. I don't know if the visitors here have had the chance to move around. We see the lorries driving with the animals. It's not so nice. And you go to the slaughterhouses and it becomes even more uh, so. Uh, and then there's the issue of quality management, maybe linked to, well, the, along the whole value chain. Um, I don't want to say more, but that is, a, is an issue. But there are areas of opportunity, as we were told earlier, a challenge is an opportunity to the private sector. So there's opening of, of opportunity within the, the veterinary services. Yes, it's a government mandate to do certain things, but there are other things which private vets can also do. Of course, they need to be authorized. Also, drug provision. We're hearing about the development of vaccines, the local provision of drugs. The difficulty, in some cases, of getting the drugs needed. Again, there's an opportunity. Breed improvement. We're seeing some good examples. We have our government uh, NAGRIC and uh, BB, which is uh, the government side of breed development, genetic resources development. But there's also capacity, a lot of capacity within the private sector to, to do that. Feed, pro feed provision, um, both the improvement of rangelands, um, we're concerned with the environment, but also in concentrate feeds and other feed supplements. Um, and then, of course, the whole issue of production. How can we get more from these animals? that we're doing, uh, working with. And then abattoir development. Just recently there's been a, or very recently there's been a new abattoir open, but in the last year, I think there's been two or three open. And they're much higher in standards as well than if you would go to meet Pakistan in Kampala. You'll see a great difference between the way those newer ones are working and the older traditional ones. And then value addition has been talked about already by the PS and by others. And then uh, quality management services. How can we monitor that quality to make sure that the, the investor, the end producer, the end market is getting the quality that they want? And then ourselves, sitting between the private sector and the government, you know, what are the government priorities? Of course, policy enforcement. Somebody says Uganda has the best policies, but maybe the weakest enforcement. Maybe. <laughs> it certainly is not the best. And we know that we can improve, even within the ministry, we know there's areas of improvement. And many of you investors have experienced that. We experience it um, as we live in Uganda. Adequate manpower. Some of the reasons for that poor enforcement is the simple lack of manpower. They can't be everywhere at once with a few people. And again, the PS, is it the PS directing us to community policing and other ways to ensure policy is um, enforced. Um, adequate drug provision. Um, Animal disease, can, we can have an outbreak and suddenly we need a lot of uh, vaccines or an, another treatment. And that can sometimes be a problem. So producers have to find other means of, of getting those drugs if they can, or some people just lose animals, as we heard this morning from the big producer. Efficient service provision. Yes, the government is meant to do A, B, and C, but we can't wait a week for it. We need it done tomorrow, whenever it might be. And uh, at the moment, that's not always possible. So we know we need to improve the efficiency within the, the ministry services 
to the uh, livestock sector and particularly the beef sector in this case. And then an allowance of private sector participation. As a ministry, we don't need to do everything. We can't do everything. Where can the private sector come in to fill those gaps quite legitimately and make our work on the government side more efficient, more effective, more available to the private sector? And so I'm part of MOBIP, uh, which is uh, a market orientated and environmentally sustainable beef industry in Uganda. Bit of a long title, so we call it MOBIP. Um, and uh, basically, we're looking at policy development, uh, productivity improvement, and value addition and quality insurance. I just want us to look at these pictures because those are examples of improved improvement. The first one on the, your left is uh, uh, Seven Hills Farm, where they're developing a feedlot system. Very basic that they're doing, and they're finding much better performance from their animals. Um, the second one, or the middle one, is from Sanger Meat Industries in Kuruhira. <coughs> and uh, there you see a modern abattoir, deep in the rural place, producing good quality meat. And the final one is a much smaller operation, to Mupe and Ontebi, just near the office. And uh, you see there a small, I think it's a family setup, where they have the animals that are producing quality meat to a high standard. Um, so there is already signs of, of improvement and there's an opportunity for investors to take that further and to expand that. Um, a little bit of, because I also have to wear my EU hat and, uh, and it also is a concern of course, uh, that we also need to have these cross-cutting issues. Um, sustainability. Actually I think that beef is quite sustainable in that we don't need to cut all the trees to grow beef. Although your example was showing quite a lot of trees cut down. But, uh, um, and of course we have the link with climate change and everything. So in Britain where I'm from they're telling us to eat less meat. So we need to be aware of that and make our, our beef sustainable as possible. Uh, we need to have a clean green energy low carbon and, uh, and then inclusive of job creation, particularly on women and beef. And our sector is very much male orientated. This is where we're working and uh, these are the conclusions but I've already given those through what the private sector can do. And this is my catch line, invest in beef, build on tradition and opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Alistair. Please give him a better hand of applause. <laughs> Engaging, but he also kept to time. Thank you so much. Um, as we continue to try to get all, and remember please to note down your questions for him uh, in writing so that you don't forget them uh, when we come to the Q&A. Uh, we now move to the poultry subsector, getting some investor perspectives from poultry. And our first presenter is uh, Craig Nielsen, Chief Executive Officer of b Zika Poultry International Limited. I hope I pronounced that right. Okay, please, let's uh, go on again. I'll give you a few seconds to compose yourself and then I'll start the time. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the poultry sector. Uh, what uh, I was tasked to do today was just to give you a bit of background about what BNZ Poultry International actually does, some of the challenges and successes that we've faced, and how we could sort of build uh, or stretch our hands and to, to partner with respective stakeholders such as Maev. Benzika poultry has been in Uganda with the Mokasa family started in the 1990s. Uh, in 2013 the, the business opportunity looked good and uh, they welcomed two private equity firms to come and invest in them. In 2014 another a third private in, in uh, equity firm invested again and they took a majority stake in that business. Towards the end of December 2016, uh, the 8 miles that had the majority uh, purchased the, the remaining share and at the moment Bienzika Poultry has got three private equity firms uh, invested in the business. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm not as uh, young looking as I should be because I've got three different push and pull shareholders that we have to deal with. Uh, 
we with the private equity coming in, it obviously uh, accelerated the need to, to to build the business and develop it and, and put best practice in, 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 uh, into into action. And uh, currently today, just to give you a bit of perspective, uh, we've got 760 staff employed at Benziga, up from 430 back in, uh, in 2015, 2016. Uh, we've got a fully functioning HR department, uh, training managers and everything, uh, trying to address the, the skills needs that, uh, that we've so much uh, put forward uh, over the last two days. However, we've also faced some challenges, but I just, I just want to uh, put some numbers up there that even though we are struggling in agriculture, uh, we've had some major challenges, we've managed to still grow the business. And that's exciting for, for Uganda. Uh, we've got a, a growing population, there's a uh, very good uh, environment to, to get raw materials, there's a growing middle class, maybe not as fast as we would like, but it is there. And so therefore, we are, as investors, seeing tremendous opportunity going forward. And with that, our shareholders are, have already approved um, a further injection of, of $10 million that it's going to be, we're going to be expanding in with Benzico over the next two years. Just to give you a bit of an idea of, a, of where we are in the value chain, we currently have breeder farms, hatcheries, broiler farms. We're busy in a commissioning phase with a, with a new processing abattoir. We've got retail outlets, and we've got feed milling and silos. In the, the yellow blocks there is where we're yet to invest in. Uh, at this point in time, uh, it's a business, it's, a, it's very capital intensive to, uh, to invest in, in, in in the new technology in poultry, so we've, we're not in the grandparent stock yet, and uh, we are still trying to um, implement best practice in, in, in our current core business now, so we're not really looking into uh, doing our own crops. We buy a lot of our crops from our small-scale farmers. Just to give you an idea of some of our capacity, uh, you can see there we've got a feed mill that can do 66,000 tons. We're currently doing 32,000 tons uh, per annum. Um, we've got uh, grain storage facilities, uh, which helps us to, to be able to procure the crop at the right time, at the right price. Uh, we've got quite a lot of capacity on our breeder farms and our hatcheries. Um, and those are just some of the numbers that, that we're looking at. Some of the challenges that we've had to face. In 2017, as we all know, we had the bird flu outbreak. Just a direct loss from, from uh, DOC exports to the region was around about 2.5 billion shillings per annum. That's just for ourselves. Um, unfortunately, I'd like to just, uh, the PS is not here, but the borders are not open yet, unfortunately. The, uh, a lot of our customers are trying to get uh, import permits in, in Kenya and, and the likes and they, they're not getting them. So uh, it's just something that we're hoping that over the next couple of weeks that will uh, open up. Importation of vaccines for breeder flocks is a ch has been a challenge and, and I think it's going to remain a challenge uh, as uh, MIF and NDA work out the policies there. Uh, unfortunately, breeders you know, a lot of little different vaccines um, and the importation of that is proving challenging. The importation of coccidia stats for the poultry feeds, as a, as a, as a, a big enterprise such as ourselves, we can use vaccines to, for some of the coccid, uh, coccidiosis issues. However, our small farmers do not have that luxury. So we feel that there's a potential risk and we need to uh, work with the Ministry on how we can minimize or mitigate that risk to our small-scale farmers in, in the future when we're not allowed to import the coccidio step and uh, include it in the feed, feed offering. Poultry imports 
that's DOCs and meat products dumping, uh, as was mentioned earlier, those are the challenges that we still face. Lack of, lack of policy and regulatory framework, and then obviously the big one, skilled labor. Um, as, as I said earlier, we've grown our business from 430 people now to 760. We've had to develop our own training. We've had to bring in interns. Uh, we've had to also bring in, unfortunately, uh, expatriate expertise. Uh, but we're on a very accelerated uh, transfer of knowledge program and uh, I'm happy to uh, have heard yesterday the people from Makareri to say that uh, they're willing to talk to us to see how we can mutually uh, skill up the labor force to meet these uh, expansion programs that we have. And I'm talking specifically on our, in the poultry industry. Insecurity in and around uh, remote sites is very important to engage with the community. However, um, we have had some problems in some of our, our sites when the community felt that the chicken was good to eat. And, uh, and not only was there theft, but you know, every time people go over the fence, there's a, a biosecurity breach. And so uh, it's, it's something that we, it's a challenge that we're fighting on. And, uh, His Excellency did provide us with some army patrols and that, so that has helped us in the, in the, in the last four or five months. Successes. We've successfully launched a, a poultry extension services, which we uh, we've got a number of veterinary officers that go around and support our farmers. We've uh, launched a commercial broiler acro scheme. We've also launched a school poultry program, which we we, we approach schools uh, at uh, P6 P7 level. Uh, we give them feed and, and chicks, and we try and educate the children. In, in poultry husbandry. Uh, and that's probably taken from the Coca-Cola. We, we want the younger generation to, to get to know poultry. Uh, we've started to export feeds, uh, pre feed products to the Rwanda and DLC. Uh, we've done obviously already uh, a big expansion program. We've uh, developed a new hatchery in Abattoir, breeder farm, dedicated rearing already in 2018. And as I said earlier, We've got another $10 million that will be going into new breeder farms, new boiler farms, and also to up, upgrade our current laboratory and feed mill. The support that we need from the government and other stakeholders. We, we urge government please to push forward on the policy, uh, policy and regulatory framework commitments that you said. I think a very big important one for us is the Animal Feed Act. Uh, I think we're one of the only mills feed mills in, in the country that's HACCP accredited. Unfortunately, we are competing against roadside millers and mixers and stuff like that. And uh, we need the government to support support the, this. Uh, the farmer needs it. A lot of farmers are buying Dale chicks from us. Then they're doing home mixing and uh, they're having disastrous results uh, with their, their life savings as they go into a poultry endeavor with not the right feed or not the right expertise. We need guidance and support from MIF and NDA uh, to try and solve the vaccine issues and, and definitely we need to discuss a way forward for the Coxidia set. Uh, we feel uh, in our business that that is a, a, a serious risk that is coming our way. Uh, and it, it, you know, for us as a, as, a, as a big enterprise, we can always invest more money in, in making bigger boiler farms and we will squeeze out the small-scale farmer much faster. But if, especially if the small-scale farmer is going to uh, get a lot of losses and they become very inefficient. And unfortunately, the coccidiostat issue is something that's looming on the horizon. Uh, again, assist with the opening of borders and obviously more training of extension officers and basically protection from the poultry dumping. At the end of the day, my final statement regarding the elevator pitch is we're expanding, we need our growers, we want to encourage new, young and especially women to come and uh, have a look at the poultry industry, it's vibrant. We're looking for distributors for our, our downstream investments and we're looking for students are looking for uh, to, to come into the poultry industry. 
You're all welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Craig. And you will have noticed that uh, I switched off the timer for Craig. I was not being unfair to him. I mean, I was not being unfair to the other presenters. But I thought that last slide that he was talking about really is the crux of the matter. Uh, it's really why we are here today, is what can the private sector expect from government? And I think you can begin to see now that you know, we heard from the public sector, we heard from the, the policy makers what they're doing, and it was all very coherent, very good, but you can see that there are still uh, challenges uh, with that the private sector is facing. On this issue around the, the border, you know, I, I feel a little bit responsible because I'm from Kenya myself <laughs> about the border closure. Um, so let me just provide some unofficial clarity because I don't speak for the government of Kenya. But it is true that His Excellency President Yuri Museveni did come to Kenya and this issue was discussed and it was announced publicly, publicly by the President of Kenya, His Excellency President Kenyatta that the border would be opened, not just for poultry, but a number of other issues that were discussed. Now, the only thing I will say is that, you know, there are different, different countries have different systems. There are some countries where when the president speaks, everybody shakes and stands to attention and does what he says. And there are some countries where it doesn't happen. I will leave you to determine where Kenya goes. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> <laughs> don't, don't quote me. So now uh, we are we are coming to the uh, dairy subsector. Again, uh, we are in the animal industry here, so different subsectors are presenting. Our next presenter is uh, Amit Sagar, Chief Executive Officer of Pearl Dairy. Amit, I'll give you a few uh, seconds to compose yourself, get familiar with this podium, and then I will start the time. Thank you very much. Give him a round of applause, please. Yes, I'm, also, I'm also a fellow Kenyan, uh, born in Kenya, but then we've been invested in Uganda for over 20 years in various businesses, and uh, one of them is um, dairy. So today I'll speak on behalf of the people of Barara, that's where uh, our dairy is located. And uh, just to give you a background of, you know, we started the uh, Pearl Dairy Farms around six years ago in Barara. And when we started uh, in the rainy season, people in Barara used to throw away the milk. Um, I can proudly say now we have run out of milk and now we are looking for more milk every day. Um, just to uh, give you an idea of what we, we do, we produce UHT milk, we produce milk powder, and uh, butter, and now soon we're going to be starting to produce yogurt. Um, just to give you an idea what happened to the dairy sector after Pearl Dairy came into Uganda. Uh, exports of dairy have shot up astromatically, and uh, we contribute more than 80% of all dairy exports that happen out of Uganda. And, uh, and soon, uh, um, dairy will now become uh, the number two export earner for uh, Uganda and it will become the largest value-added exporter of the Uganda in terms of earning hard currency for Uganda. Um, so, you know, the success has been mainly driven by not only, uh, it's, it's about finding a market for your product as well as uh, making quality products that penetrate to international standards. So it's a very challenging process because one is you can produce very well, but you don't know where to sell it. So. So our success has been that we've been able to find market for Ugandan products and uh, we're leveraging the ESC and uh, we're happy to say that we distribute directly uh, our products made in Barara in all ESC countries uh, including uh, Kenya, Tanzania and uh, Southern Sudan as well and Rwanda. Uh, um, so, so where, where we are right now um, in terms of uh, our business is that we, we now look for milk every day. Our challenge is that we don't have enough uh, Fonterra, so we cannot grow and compete in this international market if we're not as cost effective as them. And that's basically the challenge, you know, getting farmers to understand that it's not about the price, it's about the productivity. 
the average productivity of a cow in, in, in the region still is around six to seven liters. And even before going into the genetics of the, of the breeds, uh, they can easily get to 15. And then it's only a matter of small changes on the farm. So I'd just like to share, as per day, we've now got an initiative working with the farmers in our Barara region. We now have a team of 50 dedicated people who are working with farmers to help them um, move from cattle keepers to commercial dairy farmers. And we've just started this project nine months ago. We've invested over $2 million just alone in this project um, in terms of, and, uh, of giving back to the farmers that we're working with. And, and the concept is very simple. We, we make lead farms and then we recruit farmers around the lead farm. So we've now um, uh, have 394 farmers on the program and uh, most of these farmers already already had more than 20 milking cows. And now uh, we'll just take you through what we're doing with them. So, you know, we the basic things, they didn't have any animal identification, they didn't have record keeping, they didn't have hygiene issues. Water is of course the biggest issue on the, on the farm. I mean, a cow needs 80 liters of uh, uh, water a day to, to give you good milk. But um, even though some farms have invested in dams, but by the time the cow walks one kilometer to the dam, it comes back, the, the, the whole objective has been defeated because it's burnt out the water. So, so the, the challenges we have on the farms is that the farmers know what they need, but of course they don't have means of finance rules to do it. Um, you know, irrigating a farm uh, is not a joke. Uh, and then, of course, you know, they say solar, but then solar gets stolen, right? I mean, uh, so effectively, everybody is still using generator uh, fuel pumps uh, for pumping water around the farm. So we are we are working with the farmers um, to for pasture management, growing grass to manage the dry season and rainy season. And I would just like to share with you some of the uh, some of the, uh, uh, the the data. It's like some one of the farms that we worked on. Uh, is the farm owner is called Polly. Um, we've managed uh, within a year to double the milk production with the same number of cows, and not changing any breed. And and then effectively, the message I would like to pass on here is that um, one is that you know Uganda probably has the potential of becoming the New Zealand of Africa. We need a lot more people to go into dairy farming because we're not getting enough milk. In terms of what we need from the government is, you know, simple things, infrastructure, electricity to the farms. Um, we need a um, road network to the farm. The biggest issue we have currently is collecting milk. For a distance of, if I go to Barara and I want to go visit farms, I cannot visit more than two farms in one day. Um, the distances are like 30 kilometers, but to go to one farm takes you for four hours. The farmers don't have, uh, they have to rely on Boda Boda to transport the milk from the farm to the nearest collection center. The Boda Boda chops off more than 10% uh, of the earnings, sometimes 20%. So we have a lot of infrastructure gaps um, uh, to, uh, for, for us to make sure that the farmer gets the full value for what they're producing. Second issue we have is about, around veterinary services. Ticks is the biggest issue we have in the farming community. And, and, the, and, the, and the issue is access to the correct medicine. Sometimes the diluted, there's lack of policing enforcement of what the farmers are buying. So if I was to ask uh, uh, for support needed, it's infrastructure. It's about get, enforcing the policies around the veterinary and ensuring that you know, our farmers don't lose uh, the, uh, the animals. And of course, the, the, the last one um, around, uh, you know, they say border closing and so on. Our dairy industry in Uganda is, is an export dependent dairy sector. Um, and, uh, and if we don't protect our markets that we've created with our neighbors, of course, then the industry can collapse uh, uh, overnight. So, you know, we, we thank the president and the government that recently there was an issue we also had um, with our neighbors, but then they resolved it very timely. Uh, and, uh, we are still continuing in business and uh, of course we, we, uh, what we're looking to do is make Uganda the New Zealand of Africa. Uh, Africa shouldn't be importing any milk from anywhere outside of Africa. And uh, Uganda, Uganda, the weather, the, the location, Western Uganda has the potential to feed all of Africa. Uh, um, should we just get our act together as Ugandans uh, in, in ensuring that you know we get the productivity up and, and in terms of people looking to invest in this sector, there is a lot of uh, uh, opportunity available in Western Uganda. Farmers need a lot of inputs. Farmers need um, a lot of uh, services for their, uh, for their farms. 
If anybody wants to uh, invest in those areas, they can always ask us where in the value chain we need help. And of course, the last and most important is access to finance for farmers. Uh, we are working with multiple uh, grants and so on where we are, help we are helping farmers get uh, access to finance at a subsidized rate. But of course, if we can have more people support in uh, ensuring that we can get the farmers uh, not only the finance but also the right equipment uh, on the farms, we can always grow the dairy sector uh, together. So that's my uh, pitch of the dairy sector. Thank you. I would ask for an extra round of applause for me. Not only is he a Kenyan doing business in Uganda, <laughs> but he took nine minutes uh, to, to finish the presentation. Uh, very, very efficient. Uh, I applaud you. And again, I ask all of you to note down your questions uh, in writing so that uh, they can be addressed. Thank you very much, uh, Amit. Now, the next area is uh, the question Amit mentioned as part of a problem, is raising capital to scale your farming business. Uh, so uh, to have some insights from a family business, we have Mr. Richard Tugume, Director, Jackie Davis Farming World Limited, Innovation Ventures Fund Limited. Uh, please give us your presentation. I'll give you a few minutes, as I have done with everybody else, to familiarize yourself. And as you start speaking, I will start the timer. Please, please give him a round of applause to encourage you. All right. Thank you, Richard. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Richard. Uh, as we well mentioned, my name is Richard Tugume Tugiarikayo. Um, I define myself as a practitioner at the confluence of five elements. <clears throat> the first element is agriculture, more specifically the farming component of agriculture. The second of those elements is business. The third one is finance. The fourth one is innovation. And the fifth one is philosophy. Um, and having said that, I practice those five things in a number of ways. The first thing, as really mentioned, I am the founder and CEO of a ranching business called Jack Davis Family World. I'm also the, family and, the founder and CEO of an of a venture capital fund called Innovation, Innovation Ventures Fund Limited. I am also the country director and East African investment director of a Germany-based impact investment fund called Unus Social Business Foundation, Uganda. Um, and I am also the founder and CEO of uh, our philosophy fund or actual association called uh, the Practitioners of Contemporary Philosophy. Um, I, I guess the, the, the question might arise very quickly to ask how do I do all these many things at the same time? But my answer is very simple. Um, I also ask myself how we're able to have five senses at the same time. How could we listen, uh, hear, see, smell, feel, you know, do all these things at the same time? So that is how I kind of manage it. Um, but having said that, I, have a, I was told to share a story about my farming experience and financing. Um, and now, talking philosophically, it's not even more of a story, it is a sharing of an accident. Uh, because it's commonly said that uh, when something happens the first time, it's an accident. The second time, it's an incident. The third time, it is a habit. Um, but in, uh, in, in the case of Uganda, I want to say that the, the farming sector in this country has been traditionally left to what society has previously deemed as the failures. When you, get, when you are lucky to get an education, a form of education, and you go to school, uh, you don't get a job, you end up in the corporate sector. Uh, if you are a little luckier, you, or less luckier, sorry, you end up in the business sector. And if you're very unfortunate, you have no options, then you end up farming. Actually, to the extent that even if, if being a farmer is an abuse in this country, you part of the word mulini, you know, you, you are a failure, you, you go and dig, go and really dark, so that is. So that, that is how the farming has been taken. So, 
the, the farming stories in this country, I, I like to call them, are, are a, an aggregation of a number of accidents. You know, we all go and, you know, have our, uh, our different accidents and come in one room to talk about, you know, how the various accidents have played out. <laughs> so I'm here to, to, to talk about money. Uh, that, that's, that's how I see it, very philosophically. <laughs> so my, my farming accident happened about 11 years ago, actually 12 to be exact. Um, and what happens is that uh, also by accident, I happen to be born in a farming family. Um, and uh, so in 2007, I happened to have a few savings and decided to say, I can begin a goat project. Uh, and as of course, as a tradition, there is no one-stop shop to learn many of new things. And so, you know, I put a few pennies together, went to a goat market in Changwanzi. I'm talking about Changwanzi, 134 kilometers from here, two and a half hours from Kampala as well. And decided to put up a, a, a goat pen, put up a chain link fence around it, and uh, bought my first maybe 12, 15 goats. Uh, hired my first herdsman and, you know, gave my blessings. Um, a month or two into the project, my husband tells me, you know what? Uh, I think you need to buy one cow because, uh, you know, I need to drink some milk as the herdsman. And also, some of the goats that uh, give birth don't have enough milk, others are bad mothers, so they need some supplementary milk from the cow. So I then got into the cow accident. <laughs> my difference. So I bought my first cow, uh, mid-2007, um, and uh, the journey started. We began, uh, before I knew it, the numbers began growing, um, and uh, along the way, of obviously, because of uh, diversifying risk, like we've uh, been told, I said to go to, into a number of other fields. So, you know, I put on the sheep, uh, the chicken, uh, I went into rabbits, turkeys, you know, apiary. I have done many, many things, again by accident. <laughs> uh, but that's a word in, in my presentation. And, 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 and in those accidents, I have learned many things that are never taught in any school. Um, and what I've learned is that uh, 10 years down the road, only two of those many accidents were bankable. Um, and that was, uh, that was bull fattening and matoke growing. Uh, at my 10 years, I had enough, uh, I, had, I had built enough numbers, I'm talking about a few hundreds here, to approach the bank and begin talking, you know, some bank language. Um, unfortunately, I found that the banks have never understood a regard to financing. Um, so I, I, I first went for the ACF guys who say they are cheap and they understand these things. And the first thing I was told, uh, was that you see you you you've got to you, you've got to first of all convince us that if you have a hundred bulls on your farm there is a market and that uh, the only way you can convince us is to bring us a contract a piece of paper saying that I will take them at a given price and I told him that's ridiculous because one of the things I have learned in those ten years is that an animal for meat has a ready market at any time and hour of the day. You know, I, 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 have sold, I, I have sold animals on my phone even when I've been, you know, tens of thousands of kilometers away from, from my home. Uh, but the bankers didn't understand that. The second thing they told me is that, uh, they asked me for the, for the cash cycle. I, and, and I deal with an 18 month cash cycle in my business. I, deal this, I, I buy these winner bulls, five, six months old, and then offload them 18 months later on the free rent system. And they told me, I've got, even when I take the facility, I must have a monthly interest payment. Like the Chikubo guy who trades in sugar and, you know, cigarettes and all these things. And so, you know, I, I hung up on them and just told them to go to hell. Uh, and I decided to stay up and I'll do my own thing. So then I, I tried to put on my innovation hat of the five process I talked about. Uh, I, I looked for my innovation hat and put it on. So I, I, I decided to found my own and first venture capital fund that focuses on agriculture. And the name for all convenience was called Innovation Ventures Fund. I opened up, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a family uh, best fund with my wife and three children as shareholders. Uh, and then we went out pitching. We said we shall look for individuals and service clubs who can believe in us. So we set up a, a nice profile, registered the business, 
opened the account and we were ready to go. This was October of 2017. And so I went out pitching. I met a number of savings clubs. They have a lot of money. If you're not aware, the study was done about two years ago by a friend of mine who was in the Capital Markets Authority in terms of research and development. And they found that they, they, the savings clubs at the time, this was about 2015, had a whopping 36 billion UGX sitting in commercial banks undeployed because they didn't know what to do with it. Um, so yes, I knew that was an opportunity. Even if I could get, you know, a big 20 percent of that, I would be ready to go. So I began pitching. I first uh, pitched to some guys called ICAO. ICAO is called, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an association that brings together the savings clubs of the country. Um, and they sit in the Ministry of Finance boardroom every last Thursday of the month. So I made my pitch there. I got several hand clubs. But, uh, you know, very few responses. People were very edgy about the whole thing. But my pitch was very simple. I said I have a business. I've been doing this for the last 10 years, so I have been risked it to a large extent. Um, actually, I had done a few things. One, I had approached the insurance companies. Um, and uh, I think we're going to be having a, one of them talking today. And uh, we, we became the first beef farm in this country that had insured beef animals, you know, uh, under comprehensive risk to look disease and theft. And what I had done was that uh, I decided to use a, a new system where I would insure animals in batches based on investors. So if you came and gave me 20 million shillings, I would then break that down into the number of animals that fit into that value, loaded up with interest, um, and then I would take out an insurance policy for that number of animals, let's assume there are 23 of them, and then I'll give you that insurance policy as, uh, you know, uh, like insurance cover for, uh, for your animals, so that you can act like security. And so, and, and so you know, I, I, I was using that as my, main, as my main touch point. I also had a very, a very attractive interest rate for, for the, early, the early movers. I had put it up at 30% per year. Um, and so it took me the first two months, and I got my first two investors, one savings club and one individual, who put in the first 50 million and 10 million shillings. Um, and uh, that was our first big break. Uh, we, we since went on to raise 525 million in the next four months after that. Um, and uh, we capped at that point and then worked to begin proving concept at that point. Um, and I want to report that uh, the first 18 month cycle has already gone round, April, April 2019, and we paid the first investors that came in, the first 10 and 50, so first 50. And we are now on the brink of securing our first 1 billion shilling single investment from one institutional investor. Um, but, and having said that, I, I would like to say that uh, what does the future look like um, for us in terms of uh, pushing innovation and frontiers forward? Um, we would like to see a few things happen. We are pushing for innovation in which we want to found the first animal stock exchange. Where we are going to profile all our animals on the farm and have a title per animal. Just like you have a, your logbook for your car. We shall have like a logbook for the animal with all the specs, you know, the edge, you know, the, 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 you know, the breed, you know, and, and all, the, all the parameters involved. And then we can have a, an electronic platform where we float, you know, the animals in the exchange. And then you can have, a, you can have buyers coming in to buy them electronically as they actually physically exist, uh, as an innovation to push the industry forward. Uh, two, we are also going to be pushing for having uh, these, what I would like to call titles for these animals, also become like a medium, like a financial instrument. But when you're an investor in, in, in my business, and you have this uh, insurance, uh, insurance policy covering your, your batch of animals, you don't have to sit for 18 months doing nothing or waiting for a maturity of investment. You could actually, mid, mid stream of the investment, use it as an instrument to leverage further financing for yourself. 
like take it to a bank and have it discounted uh, or use it for security to leverage more financing for something else, an emergency, and things like that. And that's where we shall need some government support uh, to operationalize the, the legality around it. And then, of course, we are looking at using this model as a blueprint, now the fund back the funding model and the investment model as a blueprint to expand it outside of our boundaries of the farm. Because we're only operating on four square miles, which can hold up to 2,500 animals at, at scale. But we are looking at expanding to begin, you know, thinking with thinking tens of thousands of animals going forward. I would like to end with two main challenges or pleas to government through my uh, One is to um, put more effort or more focus on having agricultural activities disseminated or trained uh, or delivered with a business sense to it. And I'll give you an example. Um, I, 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 in many of these conferences I go to, I always hear ideas of complaints about what is going wrong. You know, the bad feeds, uh, the, the poor transportation of animals in these lorries, uh, transporting meat in uh, sacks and caveras. But people never ask themselves as to why that is happening. Is it that we are all fools? The whole country is a bunch of fools that we never see the right things. And the answer is, we are not seeing the business element. It is because the market is not yet able to pay for those things. It is, it's that, that is a simple reason about it. Or even irrigation. Because why are we not irrigating? Do you think that you, the government, or you, the external partners, you love my cows more than myself, or my crops, and I can't irrigate them? It is because if, if I were if I, to regret, the market can't pay for that irrigation system. I mean to market, market growing. So if you're a good dribbler out there outside of the field, that is irrelevant. <laughs> that is where the good track of the transportation you're talking about is coming from. <laughs> Come to the pitch, and the pitch is the market. <laughs> yes. I, want to I want to challenge the agricultural people and policy experts, please include the business sense in all agricultural talk. That's my first plea. My second and last one, as I summarize, is that um, we must focus more on developing indigenous innovations. In this sense, I have, like I said, there are many things that any farmer will tell you they are never taught in any class. In fact, I give the example that even if you have your PhD in agricultural economics or agricultural anything, from Harvard or, or MIT or wherever the best university is, you cannot come and compete with me on my turf. It's as simple as that. There are things I have learned and known that there is no school that knows them. So let's harness indigenous innovations, let's document them, let's perfect them, let's Scale disseminate up. them with a business sense. Thank you very much. Um, again, as uh, as the moderator, I decided to allow Richard a little yeah. bit more time. <laughs> not, <laughs> not just because he wears many hats, it was an but again, I felt that he was going to land, and he landed exactly in the place where is the crux of this matter. You see, <laughs> you see. I think what Richard is saying is something I've experienced in many African countries, is we take an integrated approach to the value chain and we invite the private sector to invest in that value chain, not understanding that there are aspects of the value chain, there are challenges in the value chain that cannot be solved by commercial money. And so, as he says, if you say there is no road, there is no electricity, or we should irrigate, those challenges cannot be solved with commercial money. <clears throat> and yet, if the value chain is to be developed, you have to overcome those challenges. You have to. And so the question is, how do we help the Richards of this world, and many others who are experiencing the same thing? Um, Amit talked about taking four hours to drive 30 kilometers because of the roads. It doesn't matter whether Pearl Dairies make, makes a turnover of $200 million. They will not build roads. 
because the market is not prepared to pay for it. Uh, that was a very, very important point, Richard, and very well uh, delivered. So thank you very much. Again, uh, give him a round of applause. Right, so we have been talking a lot about feats, and uh, very proudly our first female presenter in terms of the private sector, uh, Dr. Birungi Karutaro, country team leader, Kilimo Trust. Uh, to talk about animal nutrition and, and feeds. Again, uh, I will give you a few seconds to uh, get acclimatized, and then I will I will start the clock. Thank you. Very give much. a round of applause to uh, Entarika. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, Kilimo Trust is a regional NGO that supports agribusinesses access markets. So essentially what we do is we support farmers, traders, processors access regional markets. And to do this we do a lot of market studies um, to understand how big the market opportunities are. So I'm just going to take you through what we have done on animal feeds so that you get a sense of how big the animal feed sector is in East Africa. So. Um, to start off, um, I can tell you that the livestock sector is in improving, is growing. Animal feeds, uh, the demand is growing. We are seeing the demand for animal feeds growing largely uh, because uh, driven by commercial livestock production. So you can see most of the speakers that have spoken here are into commercial production, either poultry, dairy and others. Um, but also we are seeing diminishing uh, grazing land. Um, due to population growth, but also climate change. Um, and also we are seeing changes in demographics that is also driving the demand for livestock products and byproducts. So, if you look at, in a nutshell, I can tell you consumption of livestock products is growing. Um, the largest is in poultry, and poultry is uh, about 11%. And even in terms of the population for livestock, we see that the largest population is in the poultry, 133 million birds in East Africa. These are 2018 um, estimates. Um, now, if we look at animal feeds, we do have a deficit of animal feeds to the tune of about 5.3 million metric tons per year in East Africa. So for the private sector, the opportunity is huge. The EAC is country currently producing about only 1.7 million metric tons, but we demand about 6 million metric tons. That should be 4.3, not 5.3. So 4.3 million metric tons. So the opportunity is there, and please invest in uh, animal feeds. If we look at the deficit, and I break it down again um, per country, uh, this was 2013, 2014 figures. The last slide I showed you was 2016. The, the, the trends keep on changing. But you can see that Uganda has the largest deficit. So locally here, the opportunities are huge. Don't worry about the numbers. In terms of Kenya and Tanzania, they, uh, the, the sector is much more developed in Kenya. And, but the demand and the deficit in Uganda is huge. We're looking at 4.4 uh, uh, 4 million metric tons per year. If we look at the demand um, uh, in the EAC, um, the categories of feeds demanded in Uganda and in, all, in Kenya and Tanzania, again, it's poultry. Poultry feeds are uh, the most demanded, uh, followed by uh, po um, poultry, and this is followed by dairy. So again, the investment opportunities are there, and uh, you can see how you can create those linkages uh, between the different sectors. The, if you look at the characteristics, there is a huge correlation between what is produced in the countries in East Africa, whether it is Kenya, Tanzania, or Uganda, and uh, in terms of animal feeds and the products, the byproducts. So you can see in Uganda, um, the animal feeds that are manufactured here are largely, largely used maize bran and um, sunflower, sun and uh, soy cake. Um, 
but there is also rice bran that is demanded in Kenya, and also maize bran that is demanded a lot in Kenya, um, and also in, um, in Tanzania. The animal feeds manufacturers, unfortunately, in East Africa are small scale, they are largely informal, and this is why the value chain is largely unstructured. So there are opportunities to improve this value chain by supporting these uh, manufacturers to grow and uh, equipping them with skills. Also, they source the raw materials in the localities in which they are. So you can see, again, there's a lot of effort that government needs to do in terms of creating opportunities for the small scale industries to harness the support that is already being given for maize, for rice, and um, sunflower investments in the country. If we look at the processor characteristics, the processors are there, even those that are small. We just heard from Bienzika that is big. When I calculated his installed processing, his current um, processing capacity is about 48%. The average that we did for the study in 2017, we found the processors are only utilizing about 44%. So again, the opportunity is there for you to ensure that these processors can actually get to about 90% installed capacity utilization. In terms of storage capacity, again, they are only utilizing about 45% of their storage capacity. This could certainly be bigger. Um, and so the opportunities are there. So what can I say are the challenges? The challenges are many. But I'll talk about the challenges and give you also what we think we can do both for the private sector and a public sector. We have a limited supply of raw materials for the manufacture of animal feeds. And here we are talking about quality and quantity. We are producing the raw material that is needed, maize bran, seed cake, whether it's oil seed cake from sunflower or, or soybean. We are not doing it well. Poor post-harvest handling, increasing aflatoxins, this is not good for the animals, and therefore it compromises on the quality of animal feeds. So we need to see how best we can improve the production of the raw materials for animal feed. But we also, one of the other ways that the private sector can benefit is to leverage um, this other investments that are being made in terms of creating linkages between those that are producing the seed cake and those that are producing animal feeds. Let us make deliberate, deliberate efforts to create those linkages so that we reduce the transaction costs and actually make this much more accessible even for the smallholder farmers. But most important of all, for those linkages to work, we must create awareness, build capacity of the producers and the food processors so that there is better management of the raw materials so that byproducts are good and um, healthy for uh, the animals that we are looking at. Remove any uh, bottlenecks, a number have been alluded to, but we think the physical incentive, fiscal incentives for regional trade in raw materials should also be there. Insufficient regulatory and policy environment, this has already been said, the Animal Feeds Act government, we really need this in place. Once we have the Animal Feeds Act, we're also looking at standards and also enforcing those standards. Mechanisms, um, to harmonize the, feed, the animal feed standards, the standards have been there, ESC level they are there, but being able to harmonize and disseminate them to all the actors is really critical. We need support there. But also research and development on production and handling of animal feeds is critical um, for our, um, our animal feeds industry. Also, we need to train experts on feed formulation because we don't have those experts to advise the small processors on the feeds formulation. And um, so at the end of the day, like Bienzika said, they are mixing and are the, uh, different formulations and the outcomes are always bad. Now, limited organization of the animal feeds industry. It is not well structured. And so we need fiscal incentives to attract big investors to structure this animal feeds industry. And also promote the creation and build the capacity of industry associations. If the private sector can come together and have it be united, have a voice, then they can even have mechanisms to self-regulate because we can't expect 
the public sector to do the self the regulation and enforce at the same time. It's very difficult. Develop a modus operandi for sampling raw materials of animal fields. Again, this is the capacity that we are talking about, both from public sector and private sector. In a nutshell, I'm telling you the opportunities for animal feeds investment are there. Please take, a, take advantage of them and invest in this area. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Birungi, for that uh, presentation. You took eight and a half minutes, so you're currently the champion in terms of keeping time. Now, I, because you still have one and a half minutes, I wanted to ask you if you're working with any private sector investors in this area today. You mentioned a lot of the, uh, the um, you know, areas of improvement. Are you working specifically with any private sector investors today? I'm not necessarily in animal feeds. We are working with uh, maize processors, sunflower processors, soybean processors, but they still do not see the market opportunity to invest in animal feeds. So that's the challenge that we have. Thank you, thank you. Please give a round of applause for that. We really appreciate you saving time for us. All right, so we're, we're coming towards the end now. We've got two more presentations. Um, the next one is around insurance. It's been talked about. And uh, in order to give us uh, more light on this, we have got Mr. Daka Munya, uh, who is the consultant on Agro Consortium for the Uganda Insurance Association. Um, thank you. We seem to have. Uh, Please give him a round of applause to encourage you. Okay, so your timing starts now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we seem to have some technical difficulties, but I'll talk. I'll, I'll try and talk from from my head. Um, my our story, unlike my elder brother here, was not by accident. <laughs> um, it started um, with. I think for us, uh, it started with me personally. Um, I'm a risk taker, and uh, I don't normally believe that um, when I'm in formal employment, that's the only income I should have. I, I try and do other things, I try and um, see if I can add to my, my income. So I decided to do piggery. Um, and then with a friend of mine, we started the Pigari project in Palisa. We were doing so well, we researched, we got vets, we got everyone. We got to a point where we had 800 uh, pigs at that place. And we were selling, almost every week we were selling uh, pigs and it was very successful. Then one day um, I moved to Nigeria, uh, posted to Nigeria, working in Nigeria. He call, my colleague called and said, um, there's something happening at the farm. The pigs are dropping one by one. So we called in a vet, and the vet came, and they told us, we have swine fever. And within five days, we lost all 800 pigs. I've been an insurer at that time for about 21 years. So I started thinking, but why was there no insurance in Uganda? What's, what's going on? So when I came back, we started looking at this and I was working for a company and I told them, why can't we do something? Then they said, okay, I don't think there's a market for it. I said, let me try and see what we can do. So I transfers the whole of Uganda, talking to people, asking them, what's going on now? I mean, what are your problems? I went to Kapchowa, I went to the West, I went to all over the country, just trying to find out what are the problems. And even in Kapchowa, I met a farmer, um, the farmer leader of a group, who told me that he had lost two farmers 
who had committed suicide. Why? Because there was a drought, they had borrowed from the bank, and the bank wanted its money, and they just decided it was not worth it, they just committed suicide. So I went back and said, but I think I have a solution, because I've researched, I've looked at the region, I've looked worldwide, these things are happening. Why can't we do the same? From where I come from, things are happening. Why can't we do the same? They said, go ahead, let's see what we can do. So we started trying to look at agriculture and see how agriculture can, can work. Um, oh, to cut the long story short, a consortium of seven insurers was formed, and it was called Kungula. It started selling agriculture insurance, but strictly just doing drought insurance. Um, as we were going on, we started thinking the uptake was not going on and things were not happening. So we, again, we started looking at what is the problem? Why are things not happening? We started looking outside again and others, and we started seeing that maybe the products we are selling are not the right products for the people. Let's again look at the, uh, and talk to the people. So we discovered that one of the things was that some of the products were not right. We were almost cutting and pasting what is happening elsewhere, which might not happen and might not be ideal for Uganda. So we started now looking specifically at what should we do. One also other thing that started coming is as, as soon as we started looking at these products and they are happening, we saw that the pricing was too very high and nothing much could be done about the pricing because of the nature of the risk of agriculture. So we said, let's look again and learn from others. So we looked, looked at India, we looked at Brazil, we looked at Senegal, Mali, Malawi, and discovered that the government was heavily involved in helping the agriculture insurance industry. And they were doing that by a lot of things subsidies, and also uh, data, uh, uh, data uh, 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 issues, uh, trying to make sure that data is available. Because for insurance to work, you need a lot of, a lot of data. So we also approached uh, our own government here, and fortunately, they did support us and say they can do something. So that is when the agriculture insurance scheme that I'm going to talk about was born. This was in July uh, 2016, where the government said, okay, we'll put together stakeholders in the agriculture insurance uh, um, um, uh, sector to see what the scheme should do and have everyone contribute uh, uh, to that and make sure that we have a scheme that works for, for everyone. So the scheme was uh, launched in July 2016 which is a, a public-private uh, partnership. Um, and its main aim was to hedge uh, Ugandan farmers against the natural risks that come up uh, when you're doing your, your farming. Whether it's crops, whether it's livestock, whatever it is, um, um, the, the scheme would help you on. So the government also asked that any insurer that was interested would also join in the scheme, but then 10 insurance companies decided that they would want to join uh, the scheme and, in, and, uh, and uh, offer agriculture insurance. And they together formed a consortium, which is called the Avro Consortium, which is the consortium that I lived um, since uh, 2016. The aim of the consortium is a platform for these 10 insurance companies to insure the farmers on different things. So we sure crops, but we also ensure uh, cattle, poultry, pigs, and also we are into uh, fisheries. Eligibility of the scheme, any farmer is eligible into the scheme. The only difference is that we categorize you whether you're a large scale or a small scale uh, farmer. And now what we do is also, uh, like my elder brother said, yeah, we talk to the people and see what they want and come up with something, and in this case, we came up with that uh, um, uh, insurance where we're, we're insuring the batches of people that, that have taken 
uh, some investment, um, I mean, that had invested in him. So we found that it's always good to always talk to the people first, hear what they want to ensure, and then tailor make it uh, to that. We categorize farmers into large scale farmers and small scale farmers. I'm not going to talk about crop, I'm going to talk more about uh, on the animal side. Uh, for the animals, we categorize you according to the number of animals that you have. Uh, so if you have a certain number, below that certain number, you're a small scale, and above that number, you're a large scale farmer. So in, in this case, maybe for cattle, if you have less than 30 animals, you are a small scale farmer, and if you have more, you are, you are a large scale farmer. That distinction comes into what the government assists you with in terms of subsidy. So if you're a large scale farmer, the government assists you with 30% of your premium payment. So you only pay 70%, the government will pay the other 70%. If you're a small scale farmer, you do 50 50 with the, with the government. And then we also appeal to a government that there are certain areas which are disaster prone. Uh, they are always year in, year out uh, disaster prone. Uh, Kasese, the Mount Egon region, Isingiro, Ngora, all those places, they are already, always um, disaster prone. In those areas, the government gives 80% uh, subsidy and you only pay uh, 20%. Uh, um, I did make my presentation specific for what we're doing. We had uh, what for this uh, for this uh, gathering here, but we do cover uh, a lot of other things. But we do on the animal side, we do cover drought, and we cover this drought based on pastures. Um, we also can cover lots of uh, milk production. We can also cover uh, when your animal loses its value because of a drought. Then we have what we call the multiple uh, uh, insurance. It can be crop, it can be with livestock. Uh, with the multiple uh, crop insurance, we normally use it for the large scale uh, farmers. Uh, this, we have different um, uh, risks that we cover from um, uh, death due to different things, disease, um, theft, and, and all, all the other normal uh, issues that, um, uh, that uh, affect the, the, the animals. Um, we also have uh, known that um, that, yes, we use for the uh, large scale, but the small scale farmers also have uh, issues. And um, I'm not going to talk much uh, about that, but I'll just paraphrase it and, and talk about it in summary. For the small scale farmers, we use uh, satellite uh, technology, that's the innovation that we use and track the pastures, how the pastures are doing. Uh, and once we know that there's lots of pastures, we also know that in turn, uh, the, the animals are, are suffering. So that's the kind of uh, um, technology that we, uh, we use. So in the end, uh, our technology will allow us uh, to be able to read uh, what is happening uh, and make that into um, we can make that into something that we can use and then allocate how much percentage of pasture has been lost uh, or has been, has been um, uh, or whether it was a, a normal rainfall uh, season or not. Um, I'm going to cut out most of these other things, but I'm going to say in our case, um, unlike most other uh, presenters <coughs> where we would say maybe government needs to do this to us, we are happy to say that the government has actually helped us uh, uh, with, uh, with subsidy. They've also helped us with funds for awareness. Obviously, we still need more help in terms of awareness. Mm -hmm. But my, my message or my pitch, my elevator pitch is that the government gave us money. Uh, each year, they give us five billion. If we use it, it can be extended to 10 billion. My pitch is that the money is available. We do not want to take it back. It's there. So those that are insured, I mean, they have got uh, cattle or, or poultry or whatever to ensure, uh, please visit us. The money is there to help you with subsidy, so you, uh, so you need to take advantage of, uh, of that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daka, for that uh, presentation.
Uh, you have a good problem in the sense that you have money and you need takers. I'm sure there will be a long queue of people waiting to see you before you, you, you leave today. So thank you. Please give him another round of applause for that. So we have come to the end of the private sector uh, presentations. We have one more presentation from the public sector. Uh, and I believe it is a representative of the Commission of Animal Health in MIFE. Um, I'm not sure of his name, but uh, I will treat you like everybody else. As soon as you start speaking, the timer will be on, and when you hear the, the alarm, then you know that uh, your time is up. Please give him a round of applause to encourage him. And uh, you are now standing between everybody at lunch, no pressure. So please uh, be succinct. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, moderator. My name is Dan Tumusime. I'm not uh, Anna Rose Okrut, but I'm representing her as a Chief Veterinary Officer of Commission on Animal Health from the Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Services. Uh, this is... Uh, this presentation, some of the things were touched by our director in the morning, in the general overview of the ministry's strategic direction to, uh, towards uh, handling issues that brought us here today. So mine will be, I will just list a few things that she talked about, uh, strategically uh, leaning to, uh, on the animal health side. It's, uh, I'll give us uh, some introduction, important diseases that are of importance to us as public sector and well uh, in consideration of the, uh, the, uh, the, of the private sector, that is the majority here. Well, we recognize that uh, the meeting, this meeting, is uh, overarching in the sense that we want to facilitate a well-targeted collaborative investment which has been uh, emphasized since morning and the, the, the talk of the value chain is actually the song now in the ministry we realize that uh, talking about diseases the pathogens the causative agents alone may not take us far unless we handle it in a sense like we had that we need to, to have a business sense and the business sense the, to the private sector is the private chain. I mean, I mean is the, it's the value chain. So along these value chains that we were introduced to this morning that are with specific emphasis to this, uh, to this meeting, include poultry, beef, dairy, piggery, aquaculture, and apiary. And health is a, is a cross-cutting issue. It cuts across all those value chains. So therefore, uh, in order to address health uh, challenges, we need to quantify the challenges themselves because we have heard that the private sector understands these issues in their own way. Okay? We, in Entebbe, may understand, may draft laws, may draft plans, may draft strategies, but to somebody who is on the pitch, like we had, they understand their, these things in their own way. So we need a careful uh, analysis of these uh, health issues, animal health issues, for us to come up with something which benefits us as a state, as, a, as, a, as, a, as government, but also as the private sector because the PS put it to you that you are a main driver for the agricultural sector in this era. Specifically, I know many of us have heard about foot and mouth disease uh, every day on TV, every day in uh, newspapers. So foot and mouth disease is one of the most biggest problems that we have in the livestock sector and specifically if you are talking about the value chains, that is the value chain for cattle, uh, for dairy beef, but also goats and sheep. <coughs> so this is a summary of the uh, important diseases. It's not uh, exhaustive, but these are the most important 
uh, for now in the country. Uh, FMD, like I've said, in the dairy and beef sector, not so prevalent in the goat and sheep industry, but dairy and beef. And it is important in a way that it, it handles national trade. When you have had of quarantine since position of trade restrictions in the areas where uh, we have had outbreaks. But also, we can't export outside this country if we have foot and mouth diseases. Foot and mouth disease is what we call Kalusu, to some of us who uh, are locals here. Our CBPP is contagious bovine pneumonia, which some of us call Rohaha. If you pick my uh, local language, you can understand that. Uh, it also causes high mortality, high deaths in uh, the affected uh, cattle. It is specifically for cattle and cattle, but also hinders national trade. And uh, still, we cannot, in, 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 uh, we cannot export because of CBPP. So, we also have lumpy skin disease. Some of us call it uh, Kifuruto. Uh, although there's no mortality, there isn't a lot of mortalities, but also there is a problem of trade. The interest is national trade. And because we can't do national trade, we can now neither do uh, international trade. Sheep and goats, although I think it wasn't uh, of much interest in this, in this, in this area, but we have uh, PPR, which causes high mortality and he does lot, both local and international trade. Contagious couple in pneumonia is the Ruaha in the courts. Uh, it causes high mortality, he does international trade. Uh, pigs, we had uh, a lot of concerns on pigs, and that is African swine fever. You can never be in a, a pig forum and that uh, African swine fever doesn't show up. So it causes high mortality and it hinders both national and international trade, which is of uh, interest to us, the private sector and the public sector. Poultry, avian influenza was briefly talked about uh, when we uh, had it, uh, an outbreak and the consequences that we had on the border closures with our neighbors in the trade of uh, live poultry and the, their products. <laughs> However, the biggest problem is Newcastle disease. Uh, in the local industry, in the local poultry industry, that affects our communities, and that affects multiplication of the stock. Aquaculture, TLV is the Tilapia Lake virus, uh, causing high mortalities and hindering both international and national trade. So, as I said in these collaborations, we look forward to your uh, uh, collaborations in investing in those areas of the value chain. Apiary and the, apiary, there are fungal diseases. I'm not an expert of apiary diseases, but there is high mortality, hindering, hindering international and national trade, but also there are diseases that are transmissible from humans to animals, and animals to humans, vice versa. Those are called zoonotic diseases, and those are a challenge to us. You have heard of rift valley fever, you have heard of brucellosis, Brucellosis particularly is a production disease to reduce on the numbers that you have on the farm. These challenges uh, were mentioned by the directors as overall, but also they have been pointed out from you, the private sector, the lack of the disease control infrastructure right from the farm. Uh, we no longer have brushes for tick control and other issues. Inadequate disease management, you heard of the inadequacies in lab diagnosis, uh, in lab diagnosis and the prevention. We no longer have, we don't have enough funds, so it's an area of opportunity for the uh, private sector to invest, for example, in the vaccine manufacture and others, so that we can enhance prevention. Lawlessness. You, we, ha we had. Uh, Participants talk about uh, irregular animal movements, illegal mo movements of animals, but that arises from the lawlessness of people, even those who are aware that it is illegal, to go on uh, moving animals <coughs> illegally. Those standards of handling animal products was well discussed in the morning. Uh, we thank the UNPS for uh, spearhead spearheading uh, quality controls in those uh, uh, 
small businesses, but still quality is a big challenge. Then uh, there is a, cha a challenge for us, the private sector, because uh, we invest at the tail end. At the tail end, when uh, you give a, a business idea to somebody in, the, in agriculture, they look at the finished product. Oh, I can start with this grain and I make the feed. But we forget how, they, how it came to be, the grain. I can invest in this milk and make yogurts, but how did it come milk? So that's why we need the comprehensive value chain uh, investment for us to look into that. The strategic direction was given by the director, I will not repeat this, it will be a repetition, she able to give that. This is an auxiliary presentation to uh, what the director gave. So in conclusion, for animals and animal products to access the appropriate international markets and even local markets, we need to invest. We need to invest along the entire value chain, right from the farm. As private sector, let's see what we can invest there at the farm. At harvest, let's see what we can invest. At processing, let's see what we can invest and also packaging and marketing. Let's see what we can invest. We have people in IT who can help us do the marketing and marketing information system that we like. So during this forum, the Chief Veterinary Officer therefore notes that it is important that emphasis is placed in value chain investment, which is holistic. Because if that is done, and one private sector, the private sector notices that efforts have been put in this value chain, you, you can easily grab one value chain, you say, let's go with this, let's go with this, let's go with this. Otherwise, that's a message. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that concluding message. Um, so I think we, we have come to the end of this session. Uh, I was hoping that we would have some time for one round of questions, but it is already two o'clock, so we are way behind in terms of uh, our agenda. Uh, but I'm informed that after this session that there will be breakout sessions. If you look at your agenda, there are four breakout sessions on the different subsectors. And each one of these panelists will be attending the session uh, in their subsector. So if you have questions, as I told you, to write them down, please, you can engage with them over lunch. Uh, and you can also raise them during the uh, breakout sessions this afternoon in order for us to save time. I think that is uh, everybody, given that it is 2 o'clock and we haven't eaten, I think everybody will appreciate that we'll make that adjustment to the agenda. If that is the case and everybody is in agreement, then I will ask uh, you to all give a big round of applause to these presenters. I think this has been very illuminating. Uh, and I saw the commissioner taking furious notes, so I think uh, she has uh, gotten the message in terms of uh, where the mismatches are between what the policies the government has uh, articulated or is articulating and what the private sector is seeing on the ground. This is really the reality that we have today. So I will extinguish my responsibility and hand back over to the chairperson of UAA to take us through uh, the next uh, process. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Sika. Very emotive presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank because when farmers, especially during the rainy season, when they go to eat, they don't like stay there for two hours. <laughs> so the plan is we are going to have a quick lunch, which I, has somebody got a watch which is working? Yes. What is that time? <laughs> so can we, can we eat in exactly 40 minutes? Yes. So can you please be back at 20 to 3? Because the, the plan is, you come back here at 20 to 3, then uh, we agree on, on the breakaway sessions. 
fisheries, you were not indicated on the, on the paper, but you have a room now, because we have seen you are there. So you come back here, we shall show you where you, you can meet as fisheries. So please go to eat now, come back at, at 20, at 20 to And the apiculture, is there anybody from, from the bees, the honey and the... Uh, yeah, we can take some.